resident of presenters. You can sit behind here or over here and you won't really be on a camera camera. And you have to sort of get to it. Get your wisdom. Good morning and welcome to the Public Safety Neighborhoods Quality of Life Committee meeting. And thank you to my colleagues, uh, Vice Chair Commissioner Suarez and Commissioner Magazine for joining us. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody, and also happy Ash Wednesday to those who observe. May you have a meaningful uh, Lent season. Today's meeting will be hybrid. Members of the public who wish to join virtually can do so via Zoom. The webinar ID is 878-3335-2956, and they can dial in by calling 312-626-626. 6799 or toll free at 888-475-4499. Stephanie, are there any announcements? Yes, we have a couple of announcements. We have one item that is deferred. It is going to be item number 22, discuss regulations pertaining to electric vehicles and devices along with city enforcement efforts and any additional regulations that may be necessary to aid in ensuring the safe operations of electrical vehicles and devices for all. Again, that item is item number 22. We also have a couple of time certains. Item number 27, we'll have a time certain of 10 a.m. Item number 26, we'll have a time certain of 10.30 a.m. Item number one, we'll have a time certain of 10.45. And item 10 will be a time certain of 10.45 as well. Which one? One and 10 are 10.45. And then we will have a time certain for item number 24 at 1 p.m. And item number two will have a time certain at 1.45. And those are the only announcements for today. Thank you. Should we get started with item 27? We can. Thank Madam you. Chair, um, and I'd like to defer item 25. Morning. Morning. Hey, I want to get further. Item 25 the Which item? 25. And also, I want to welcome Commissioner Fernandez for being here. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, item 27. Okay, so we will be hearing item number 27 discuss humane removal of animals from call spaces prior to negation of tenting. We have facilities and fleet to present the items. Good morning. Um, Elizabeth Nero, interim director for facilities and fleet management for the record. Um, the item speaks to uh, the humane removal of animals in all spaces. In terms for city buildings, we do have a pest control um, contract that requires for these areas to be inspected prior to the removal of any animals. We have with us today. Um, and program, Linda and Holly, who can speak in terms of what we can do for residential uh, facilities. Thank you. So I'm Linda Diamond. I'm the president of Sobe Cat Spay and Neuter and also the chair of the Animal Welfare Committee. Mm -hmm. I'm Holly Whalen, capital friend coordinator for the city. First supper. So the issue at hand is that we have a lot of cats and animals in general that are getting stuck underneath buildings during fumigations or when you try to bring your building up to code you are supposed to have lattice or something breathable around the outside. So what's happening are that animals are getting stuck and we're always called out last minute. Yeah. And it's not just affecting the animals, it's affecting property owners, um, property managers, building residents. We've had a situation where a building was fumigated and the day they're putting up the tent, we get notified that there's animals underneath, a resident tells us. Then, last minute, the fumigator says, well, I'm not going to fumigate. I know that there are animals underneath there. So now the property manager has to give one whole extra day of housing to their residents because they were covering the cost of the housing. Uh, Holly's out there trying to get the cats out from underneath for six hours. For six hours, the property manager's upset, the owner's upset, the residents are upset. And we've had situations where... 10 cats were found at 11, 8, 7, and then 3. Yeah. And we I mean, probably get a call once a month. So, what do we have in our toolbox to address this? Right now, we do have building code that says that you do have to close off with some kind of screening call spaces. 
that's that. Second thing we have is animal cruelty. Okay, so if you do have an animal that you're putting under uh, any situation where they're gonna die painfully, they don't have access to water, food, that's the animal cruelty. But that doesn't work because all the owner has to do is say, I didn't see him. And that's all we have to fall back on. So we've got two really cheap and easy ideas. So we have about two to 300 registered cat feeders all over Miami Beach. If they register with us, we know they're not gonna litter. They're gonna make the cats visible. They'll report to us what cats need to be fixed. So they know their cats, they know their colonies. <laughs> but they never know this is gonna happen until the tents are going up. So we propose to put out signage two weeks before crawl spaces are being closed, whether it's for fumigation or other reasons. So our feeders can see the sign and then call us and we can address it. The second thing is when you do close up, you can buy a $15 one-way cat door or dog door that swings and you can set it to only swing one way. So they can get out, but they can't get back in, 15 bucks. That would save so much angst for their property managers, property owners, residents, us, yeah. and a lot of tears from people that actually do care about the animals that are caught underneath there. Um, we also discussed potentially doing fines and you know don't really know the best way that would work, um, but this is what we have in front of us. So any questions so far? Uh, and find anything besides cats or yeah. yes, all items. possums, possums, raccoons, everything. And the door, the door, the one way door, so it's only fifteen dollars mm -hmm. on Amazon. So, how do you where, where does it get installed? So, they install it on a piece of plexiglass, it's really, really easy. It comes with a template, they just cut it out, it bolts like side by side, and then they just bolt it to wherever the cross space is. Okay. I mean, when we're informing the residents now and building owners to do it, they are doing it, and we are very successful at getting the animals out with it. And who, who would be required to put it the site? The property owner or the fumigation company? Property manager. Property manager. Because we really don't have any control over the fumigation organizations. They're not all based in Miami Beach, so right. to regulate them to do X, Y, Z is yeah. really a lot harder. And how do you, by the way, I'm the animal guy, okay? Um, how do you plan on messaging out to all the management companies that this is the new, if we were to move forward with this, that this is the new law that you have to put outside it. We would educate as we do now about the CAT program. So if, uh, I mean, and, and any kind of ordinance that's out there, such as why do they know to close their call spaces? How do they know to do that? Right. Um, a lot of it is knocking door to door. A lot of it is getting our team of 200 to 300 feeders to start educating where, around where they're feeding. Yeah. So right. it, it'll take time to get it to catch on. Well, I'm, I'm supportive. Commissioner Fernandez. Yes, and thank you so much. Uh, I think, uh, Commissioner Dominguez, were you the sponsor of, of this yes, item? Yes, I believe Vice Chair Suarez was the co sponsor. Wonderful. And certainly anything that we can do to protect animals, uh, we are we are very pet friendly <laughs> community, and I think we all love animals. Um, it, just just a few points I'm going to go through. Is any other jurisdiction doing something like this at the moment? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, we do have a Humane Society um, meeting coming up in Texas where there's a whole section on ordinances, but that's more about feeding. I didn't see a whole lot of about okay. and, and what would it be, let's say we do pass a regulation like this on signage and having to have uh, the door for the animal to be able to get out. Um, if someone does not comply, what would be potentially then the violation or the penalty for, for something like this? That's the next item where could, could we implement, implement yeah, could, could we implement a five what would that look like? Okay. And so I I guess the bigger problem is that right now the, the building code requires for crawl spaces to be enclosed? Closed. Yeah, so um, section 58.292, every opening beneath the building, including basement or cellar windows and crawl spaces shall be equipped with an approved type of screening or lattice work to keep out any animals. So that's already there. It doesn't say how to get them out. <laughs> well, right, it's to keep but, them out. But but if, if property owners would be abiding by that section of the code, technically animals wouldn't be getting in there. Correct. And Never, perhaps yeah, and, and perhaps what we should be doing a better job at is making sure that property owners are abiding by by this uh, code already. 
And I think that that perhaps should be part part of the part of the effort. Yeah, I yeah. actually think where this would be best suited is right under that section to say, uh, and should anim animals be located under that building or to, to allow animals to get out at ample time, a one-way door installed for two weeks would be the next step. Right. Because it does say they have to close it. It says nothing about helping animals get out better. Right. right. So if they are going to bring their building up to code and there's animals living in it, they just get sill it and all that stuff. Right. Which is another, we've had a, one field, which wasn't even um, to code, was cement. Yeah. We had feeders trying to shift through cement to get animals out. They're like screaming yeah. on the other side. Probably. So as long as we have something to go back on to say, hey, yes, I know you are to code, you're closing that up. But get those guys out first. Right. I just, my, 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 my only concern is that, you know, property owners sometimes need to do things on an emergency basis or they get you know, they get notified that all of a sudden there's there's a uh, rat infestation, mm -hmm. and they have the opportunity to to, to get a fumigator in there quickly. Um, but now we're saying, hey, listen, we're going to delay you for two weeks. So now the tenants, who are our residents as well, for two weeks, they're going to have to be dealing with a nuisance like a rodent or something like that for a longer period of time. Well, I, I don't believe that the they tents, the, the tents are what's killing all the cats. It's tents, not other types of fumigation. We're starting right. to death because they're locked under a closed crawl space right. and there's no fumigation. Right. All right. So but this would only apply specifically only when we do full tents of building. Full tents. Okay. Full tents. And, and we're shooting up in okay. general. If that's the in, case, in, yeah, in close to the problem. If that's if that's the case, then I'm I'm, I'm fine. Uh, okay, just to be clear, because it's it's not just fumigation. It's whenever you walk off a crawl space, even to become decode, and that's not going to take up time. While you're closing it, put the one we door. Yeah. Okay. For All right. Thank you, everybody. Is there any public comment? Uh, we don't have any public comment. Right Is now. anybody moving the item? I move it. Okay, so we're moving it yep. to recommend to commission. Yes. With, a with the favorable recommendation with these ideas. That's correct. Okay. Oh, everyone agrees? Yes. yes. Okay, number 16. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Item number 16 is discussed on the Miami Beach Commission for Women recommendation for co naming a Miami Beach street in honor of Naomi Wilson. We have Jose. Thank you. So the Miami Beach Commission for Women had put forth uh, earlier in the year, actually maybe last year, that um, there were about 18 streets that were named after men and uh, there were none after women. And they put forward two names um, and uh, both are items on uh, today's agenda, Gloria Estefan and Naomi Wilzig. And um, Jose, if you would share that. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, committee members, Jose Gonzalez, Transportation and Mobility Director. So the city has a process, an ordinance, that governs street co-names. Uh, one of the first things that needs to happen once there is a recommendation for a street co-name is to ensure that the code allows for that co-name. Our code is actually very stringent in terms of street co namings and only allows for co namings under very specific criteria. Um, honoring uh, a notable woman who has significantly impacted the city's history and culture currently is not one of those criteria. So, one of the first things that needs to happen is for the code to be amended to allow, to include the criteria that will allow the co naming to. Uh, Rob, so in a situation like this, uh, can we amend the item? And, or and, it has to start from scratch and go to the commission as a code amendment. You mean amend it to something other than the woman who has made an impact on Miami Beach? Uh, no. Uh, so he, if I understand correctly, we can't put this referral through because the code doesn't permit it. And that's what you're being asked to do is to recommend that that street so, be coning yeah. there's well, actually two items that are like that yes but first thing you do is you recommend that the uh ordinance be adopted to add this category which is what you're doing today okay 
and how do my colleagues feel about that? Madam Chair, if I could, um, as I see streets uh, all over the city named after people, uh, what allows for that and does not allow for this? Well, it's the criteria, criteria that's been adopted over right. time. And what would it. that, I mean, what would that be? What, what, al what criteria allows for the streets that have currently been named, but uh, excuse this? What, what is that so, criteria? So it says men that can... <laughs> right, 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 I mean, can yeah. name it after yeah. men, but no women? So, go ahead. You know, if I, if I yeah, may first throw the chart, like, like, for example, last year we did Andy Sweet. Yep. Uh, the Andy Sweet Street. Renaming, so we so we created and a, a rabbi too. We also did a rabbi, um, or if you look around uh, Pride Park, we've done a few. So what we did was that we amended the code to establish cri criteria. So like with Andy Sweet, I think we we established a criteria that was uh, put, you know, something like uh, like a photographer that documented Miami Beach history or something like that, uh, and we were able to fit Andy Sweet in that in that criteria. I hate to put it in these terms, in essence, we are creating the loophole through which we can nominate these individuals that we want to name street after, but it's a legal mechanism through which that we have to go through. Uh, and in this case, I think I think the recommendation is um, for the committee to recommend an amendment to the code to create the criteria of a street uh, name that honors a notable woman who has contributed significantly to the city's history and culture, mm -hmm. which Naomi significantly did. Naomi, she, I mean, she was a force uh, and, and an incredible visionary. So I would, you know, I would certainly support. Right. And, and I'm supportive of that, but right. I would just like to know why we need to create these loopholes every single year instead of just looking at the broader stringent criteria and say, let's broaden the umbrella. Well, well I, I can answer that for you. The, yeah. the way the ordinance is written, that's the way it works. Like, if you want, it's but it's meant to, I think, significantly narrow who can have a street named after them. And so, if you wanted to, uh, if you did want to name a street after somebody, it sort of requires you to go back and require it or, or, or create a category uh, that they can fit into. What are the you, categories? Sorry. You could, as a policy matter, if you wanted to, uh, do something, you could change the ordinance so it would be more general and give you more general authority, but that would open up more street. Okay, and, so and, I understand why it's tight. Vice Chair? Uh, what are the criteria now? You have the ordinance with there. Like, there are actually probably uh, five criteria. Uh, the first one is a Miami Beach police officer who died or was killed in the line of duty. A public facility located on the city street to be named, a private not for profit organization with significant historic value to the city and associated with structures which have a significant historic value or architectural significance to the city, geographic areas within the city to be named, a commercial establishment that has been in business in the city of Miami Beach for a hundred or more years and which is located on the street to be named. Those very strict criteria, right? Got it, Rabbi. Um, because of this. Because we added then, we created uh, a section to say, uh, you know, a religious leader so that contributed. And then it sunsets. Oh, many yeah. times those criteria are are um, created in such a way that they sunset after. A certain and with this one, one sunsets as well. If you said it that you drafted it that way, yes. Madam Chair, and I, I support your item, and perhaps this committee may want to consider at some point a recommendation to the city commission where maybe we take away some of the red tape in renaming. Maybe we raise the voting threshold so that if it's the wish of the city commission to rename a street after someone that's worthy, we don't have to go through this whole process that, that you're going through now of having to create the category and go through a first reading and a second reading to create a category that had to go then to the whole process then of actually naming the street. Uh, that's clearly what we're going to have to go through here to do this, and we should because it's certainly very worthwhile, but perhaps separately we should look at, maybe let's just streamline that process uh, and just raise the voting threshold going forward. Well, that's something to think about for the future. Um, for today, are we okay with moving? Oh, is there any public comment? There are no public comments. Uh, are we okay with moving forward? I'd like to move forward with uh, 
the, the sunset period. Later. Yes. So. Okay, so for Naomi, uh, yes, Arlen yeah. Baylor, okay. Um, and then now item number 18, it's for Gloria Stefan, and it's for the small portion of the street in front of the Cardozo ho Hotel that her family has owned, and we all know Gloria Stefan and her contributions to the city of Miami Beach. Can we move this item? Yeah, okay. Oh, any public comment? No. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, with all in favor? Yep. With the same right. sunset period. Yes, exactly. All right. So number tw uh, number 19. 19 uh, we have Jose is here to present. It's going to be discussion on the potential implementation of a bicycle lane on the west side of Collins Ave as a part of the upcoming Florida Department of Transportation. It's their fifth and restoration and rehabilitation project on State Road SR A1A slash Collins Avenue from 907 West 53rd Street to 75th Street. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so FDOT recently reached out to us uh, and let us know that there is a project, an upcoming project that they are planning along Collins Avenue from 63rd Street to 75th, 75th Street. As with all FDOT projects, it starts with a planning study. They completed the planning study, and as part of their due diligence, they um, brought brought to us, brought to our attention, the fact that they could potentially create a bike lane on the west side of Collins Avenue where there is currently on-street parking. And so the, the, the question that was posed to us by FDOT, if they continue to proceed with this project from the planning phase to the design phase and then ultimately the construction phase, the question that they posed is, would the city be interested in considering a bike lane on the west side of Collins Avenue within those project limits of 63rd Street to 75th Street. So we, um, we, we took a look at this issue and uh, investigated it a bit and came up with that there are 75 existing on-street parking spaces on that west side of uh, Collins Avenue, which would be impacted if the bike lane were to move forward. Um, uh, Collins Avenue, if you're familiar with that section, it's one way north, it's in North Beach, it's one way north, it's got three lanes, on-street parking on, on, on the west side, some on-street parking on the east side. And the issue is that it's it's very constrained. It's, it, and so in order to accommodate a bike lane along that segment of the corridor, there's really only two options, either repurposing the on-street parking or repurposing a travel lane, meaning of the three lanes that are there, traveling northbound, taking one of those and using it as a bike lane. So it would leave Collins with only two lanes northbound in that direction. So I have a question. So um, has there been a traffic study to see if the all three lanes are needed and if one can be repurposed? Um, and actually, a couple questions. And also, has the Allison Park Neighborhood Association been uh, contacted to see how they feel. I worry about loss of parking um, in that area. Uh, so um, Madam Chair, to your question, the repurposing process is a separate process that the DOT would need to, to go through that is uh, a lot more thorough and involved than the plan level study that they've done. Uh, so it, it it has not been looked at with the impact of removing a lane from Collins Avenue in order to accommodate a bike lane. That impact has not been looked at as yet. That would be a separate process, probably several months. Um, Vice Chair? Um, the bike lane, would it only be one way? Or is it just going to be a southbound lane? Or it, is would it... Be, it would be a one-way northbound bike lane. Because in that, it's on the west side. It's on the west side. In that section of Collins Avenue, it's one way north. So the bike lane. Oh, well, that's right. Well, okay, that's yeah. right. And yeah. technically, they can use a bike on the beach walk. Yes. Currently, in that and area. Regional bikes are allowed on the beach. And I'm the chair. Yes. Um, you know, I think there's going to be, I think there's an item. Um, I think it was you, Commissioner Burnett, is that it has an item on pack sand on the beach. Uh, the mayor. That was the mayor. The mayor. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I think. Before we re eliminate seventy five parking spaces, because that's a lot. Yeah. Um, we we should consider 
how that moves forward before we take parking away from people. You know, North Beach parking is like gold, right, Monica? Uh, and so I don't feel comfortable taking any parking spaces away, unfortunately. So, and, and, and including the fact that we're potentially building a bike lane on the beach, I think we should take a pause on that. I feel exactly the same way. Um, Stephanie, are there any public comment on this? We have met a few. Okay, Madam Chair, may I present my item? item? Yes, uh, Commissioner uh, Fernandez would like to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the city administration presenting my item. Um, I referred this item to, to the committee uh, because specifically I feel that, that before we take action, we should get input from the community. I think that this is a type of, of issue we should workshop with the neighborhood associations and vet information from them. I've received concerns um, about, about the safety of bicyclists on, on the beach walk. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, people feel that that there is too much bicycling activity on the beach walk and is becoming unsafe for pedestrians on, on on the beach walk, and so and so when the opportunity presented itself with the resurfacing of Collins Avenue to potentially uh, explore the possibility of having a bicycle lane, I thought it would be appropriate to, to to have that conversation with the neighbors. And one of the and one of the things that perhaps we could also be considering is that if Collins Avenue is not the viable option, well, is there a possibility in the, in the future, whether through the state or individually through the city, doing on Indian Creek? That perhaps is something is something that 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 could be explored. That perhaps would have a lesser impact on the parking facilities and a lesser impact on on, on the traffic but still alleviate the congestion that we see on, 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 on the beach walk. The one thing I do want to highlight about this is that, is that, that this is part of a bigger network uh, that south of this, we're working with FDLT uh, and Madam Chair, we had the pleasure of, with through your leadership of meeting with FDLT in Tallahassee about, uh, about some of the projects that, that they're doing in our city. But uh, south of this portion, we, we're doing uh, a bicycle lane uh, that's protected from traffic that goes from 41st Street, I believe, up to 63rd, up to up to 63rd Street. And so and so we should be discussing with the North Beach neighbors. How do we continue a bicycle facility north of 63rd Street? If it's not on Collins Avenue and, and if that's not feasible, well, perhaps then we could consider a separate alternative. Maybe 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 it's Indian Creek. But what I value is before we make a recommendation, take a formal recommendation, let's let's work on a community meeting. Let's ask the administration to reach out to the neighborhood associations up in North Beach, get their input as to what they feel uh, would be appropriate, uh, and then come back to the committee with that feedback so that we can issue uh, a recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner. Can we hear from the public, of course? First, we have Matthew, if we could unmute yourself. Matthew, you have two minutes. Hey. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I want to thank Commissioner Fernandez for bringing this item up to the committee to have a discussion. And I would agree with him that it is really important to have the conversation with the with the public, whether it's those in the immediate community or those who also you know live, work, and play all throughout Miami Beach. Um, to the point, I think that we should step back and say, you know, seventy five spots sounds like a lot, and sometimes it's frustrating when anytime there's a mobility potential mobility improvement, including one that's on our master plans, the first thing that is evaluated as what is the impact to car parking. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily know the methodology that was used to come up with that number. The, the loss could be even greater than that, or it could be less. Um, but I think it's important to look at the, you know, look at this holistically. Collins Avenue is used by dozens of buses a day uh, carrying thousands of people. There's other options that could be looked at instead of a typical F dot bike lane. 
There could be sidewalk level bike lanes that could potentially have less impact. There could be a shared bus bike lane that will not only have an improvement for bicyclists and potentially lessen the impact on the on the beach walk, but could also improve the flow of the thousands of people that ride public transportation in our city every day. Uh, so I just I want to stress that that we should look at this and, and be creative and see how can we expand and implement our network and how can we make uh, mobility, whether it's car, it's cars, uh, bicycling, uh, scooters, e-scooters, or public transportation better for everyone in this city. So thank you very much. Thank you. We have one more caller, Patrick. If we could unmute Patrick. Patrick, you have two minutes. Hello. Thanks for uh, taking my call. Um, I want, my name is Patrick Brushik. I live uh, next to Pride Park, which I know you guys are going to talk about later. So I appreciate your time on that. But as far as the bike lanes, um, I wanted to encourage you to really think about how we can increase uh, cyclist safety in our city. We haven't added any significant bike lanes since COVID, which we actually took some away when we used to have the bike lanes on Washington Avenue. So we've actually decreased our, our bicycle access. Um, and just this weekend, I was riding my bike on the on the beach walk um, and told that I had to leave the beach walk and go on to Collins Avenue because I only have an e-bike. I was pedaling it, my, my motor was off, but a current policy, the park ranger said, even if you're pedaling, you have to get off of the bicycle, uh, off, off of the beach walk and go into this traffic um, because that's the current policy of the city. So I'd encourage you to one, revisit that policy um, that if people are biking and pedaling uh, their bikes, I, you know, a lot of us live in small uh, apartments and we can't, have, we can't have a regular bike and an e-bike. Um, so we might just have an, an e-bike and I was, I was forced off of the, the boardwalk. So when you say that the boardwalk is an option for a cyclist, it's not an option for all the cyclists that live in um, compact city, uh, compact situations on the beach. So I just appreciate uh, your thoughts about increasing our bicycle safety and not forcing people off of the beach walk. Thank you. Thank you. And that is it for public comment. Right. So if somebody is on an e-bike, but they're pedaling, they're still kicked off. Like, why would that happen? Because I think a lot of people, we've had a lot of incidents where people have the e-bikes and they alternate back and forth. So it's been very hard to manage um, when someone is actually using the electric or versus the or pedal. Uh, vice chair. Um, I, I love the idea. Okay, because I, I mean, I, I have more miles on my scooter than my car. Really matter. Um, but it. What's concerning to me is that it's only northbound. So, you know, if a resident goes northbound and he has to come back southbound, then, um, you know, then he doesn't have a dedicated bike lane if it's not as safe. Um, you know, like, I I'm, I think uh, Commissioner Fernandez is right. I think we need to reach out to neighborhoods uh, and their and their associations and, and just get a pulse for it before we make any sort of... Uh, Wait, no, well, yeah. But before we make any sort of formal recommendation, I I suggest we we, we reach out to your and ideally, if we're gonna implement this, we should have it on the southbound lane too, uh, on Indian Creek. Um, that way, if someone's going north as a resident, they can come back south safely as well. So, um, I think I think that's super important. I guess they can probably come up Abbott or Indian Creek meets Abbott and then down, but. And, and just for clarification, Abbott Avenue does have a uh, dedicated bike lane. Where does it end? <clears throat> it ends. Um, I believe it ends at Indian Creek, right? It's just not so bad. Yeah, because I, I've taken like a script that I know I preach all the time. So let's give the direction um, for the transportation department to work with the Allison Park Neighborhood Association, the North Beach Alliance, any other organizations that are up in North Beach and bring it back for a future date. Yeah, if, if to uh, reach out to the neighborhood associations north of 63rd Street. Uh, and, and and if I may, just how much time do you guys think you'll need uh, for the before we come back to committee? I think uh, probably a month or two. Okay, so let's say so for the April date. For the April date. Okay, for the April committee. Can we also get direction for a southbound lane on Indian Creek? Um, 
Because the Abbott one is currently north. No, no, Abbott is south. But there's already a bike lane going south on Abbott, on Abbott. But it ends in it, it, it ends, ends at 69th Street, which is fair. right. So it ends at 69th, which is just one block away from Indian Creek. So what I'm saying is if we're gonna have a loop, if we're gonna have a, a direction going north on Collins, let's look for a connector. We should have a loop. Okay. And and, and if I may, the, the, yeah. the intent is to just look in general in that North Beach area. The bicycle connectivity on on Collins and Creek northbound southbound uh, to study that. Uh, if, if like if we're gonna go if we're gonna go with this, let's go all the way right instead of half, literally half. So and that's the intent. Okay, let's bring it back Could for April. Yes, of course. Yeah, I agree. It has to be part of a, a more well thought out master plan, which I'm happy to entertain. Jose, just logistically, one question I have to you as the transportation expert: You're traveling northbound from Collins Avenue and we're going to have a bike lane on the westernmost lane. So the only place people are turning, if not into a building, if you have to make a left onto a side street, you're going to have two lanes of cars doing so across a bike lane. Is that something that is one common? Okay. Right. Because I'll, I'll look at this traveling this way in a car, your bike lanes here. The only way to make a left is across your bike lane. At the at the intersections you're referring to, that, that that's correct. Uh, a lot of times it's a matter of the lesser of the two evils, uh, where usually it's best to position a bike lane where there are fewer conflicts and fewer driveways. So that's something we'll look, we'll look into that. Uh, FDOT's recommendation was on the west side. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll corroborate that just to make sure because it's a it's a it's a good point, but. There, there are going to be conflicts regardless of whether it's on the east side or, or the west side. I think in this case, it was both sides were evaluated and, and just determined that the west side would have fewer conflicts and safety. Okay, okay. 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 so can we wrap this up? Yeah, just one last question. What are you going to put to divide the bike lane street? Is it going to be like the armadillos? It's going to be poles? I think that that's not determined yet. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. It would still need to go through the zone. Got it. All, All right. right. So bring it back in April and we'll move on to item 26. Perfect. Item Sorry. number 26 has a time period for 1030 and it is a transportation item. It is to discuss the raised mobile strips recently installed on Collins Avenue between 5700 block and 5875 block by the Florida Department of Transportation as part of the current resurfacing restoration and rehabilitation project on State Road A1A College. Jose. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the issue of, of speeding, reckless driving along our major thoroughfares, particularly along Collins Avenue, has been something that's been, been a topic of discussion for some time. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, over, over a year ago now, um, it was discussed at, at this committee, and the um, at that time, the committee recommended that we approach thought and push forward safety countermeasures that would mitigate speed. Uh, it was a perception of a lot, you know, just car speeds, particularly at nighttime along that stretch. So uh, we approached that thought. At that time, I thought, let us know that they had an upcoming project, which has now, as we speak, been completed, but at that time, it was still a proposed project. And, and it was an opportunity to incorporate some speeding countermeasures as, as part of that project. And so typically when we refer to speeding countermeasures, we're talking about digital speed feedback signs, uh, signage, um, traffic calming to the extent that it, that it is allowed. However, FDOT does not allow traffic calming on its major arterials, particularly along evacuation routes like A1A, Collins Avenue. So, um, so FDOT, uh, have thought heard our concerns, and then they proposed uh, several countermeasures, including the speed, the digital speed feedback signs, uh, advisory curb ahead signs. Because in this section of Collins Avenue, as you're traveling north, approaching si the 6,000 block, there is a horizontal curve that's pretty pronounced. And so uh, with car speeding, there's a propensity for those cars to go out of control and, and uh, hit a, a building that's actually right there at the 6,000 block. I believe it's called the 6,000 Collins. So that was the, uh, the concern. So FDOT um, <clears throat> recommended and 
and actually implemented some of those safety countermeasures, which included rumble strips. So rumble strips are one of those speed deterrents. However, they have the impact that when cars go over them, they make a rumbling noise. Was the building that the rumble strips placed in front of notified and consulted in advance that they were going to have this in front of their building? Did FDOT, you know that, did FDOT consult the building telling them that this was coming or just placed it? We're not, what we've heard from the residents of the Corinthian is that FDOT did not reach out. Okay. Um, can we get public comment? So first up, we have uh, Patrick. Patrick, are you still here for this item? Sorry, you're good. Thanks. Oh, no, sorry about that. I'm not. Next up, we have uh, Will M. Well, How are you? Can you hear me okay? Yes. How are you? Uh, my name is Will Manso. I live at the Corinthian. I'm in apartment 12A. Um, I know he's going to speak, not Fredo, and I know there's some others, but uh, to answer your question, I, I never heard about any um, consulting with the building. Um, you know, I'm one of the board members. I would think that we would have been told, but we didn't. It was just a matter of one day we started hearing noise outside of our apartment and we all started wondering what it was. And then some of the members in the building decided to call the, the members of the association and figure it out. So I'll make it short and sweet. It's just really loud. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. They're basically miniature speed bumps, but the problem is people are still driving 35, 40 miles an hour over them, you know? So you're constantly hearing, doo -dum, doo -dum, doo -dum, doo -dum. I mean, all it goes on all day long. Um, and I work evenings, so I'll get I'll get home at midnight trying to go to bed, and that's all you hear. My kids are to the point where they wear they wear headsets or ear, earphone, you know, whatever, uh, because it really is it really is a nuisance to our building, especially the side you know the building that faces west, right on the Collins. And we're used to noise. Anybody who's lived on Collins, you know, you're going to hear cars, motorcycles, things. But the constant, you know, it is a constant sound of cars just passing over at a 25 to 35, 40 miles an hour. It is it is pretty bad. Thank you, Will. Alfredo? For the record, Alfredo Gonzalez, representing myself. And um, I'm also a resident of Corinthian at 5825 Collins Avenue. And to just make, to echo the same concerns, just the rumble strips went all right before Thanksgiving. And since then, they've created an incredible nu noise nuisance. They stopped reducing traffic. Anyone, welcome anyone to go out there and see. There are other countermeasures that have been employed, like reducing the speed to 20 miles an hour. That's what that, I think that's, that's there on, on the lanes, uh, signs to slow down, but the building does echo the concerns about the traffic, but it's not slowing down traffic and it's creating at all hours of the night. I, my condo faces the ocean, so I'm the furthest away from the street, yet I can sit in bed at night on my iPhone and I can hear the rumble strips through my hurricane windows. So, wow. Uh, I went on Friday night about 11 o'clock and I went over the rumble strips uh, like three times over and I could definitely hear the noise. I also went at uh, the recommendation of a resident down um, Pine Tree Drive where rumble strips had been placed all down that street and they've all been removed because the homes had complained about the noise. I'd like to hear from my colleagues if you've gone out there and have anything. Vice Chair Flores. Yeah. What are, the, are there any other options besides these? Tiny rumble strips that don't actually slow down traffic and just make noise that can be swapped Digital out. Signs. Well, can we swap them out with like a maybe a table that doesn't make noise? Uh, it's, it's the larger tables. A speed table. So yeah, well, it actually forces the drivers to slow down. Correct, correct. And we've installed those different neighborhoods around the street. However, they're only allowed on local residential streets, not on a major. FDOT does not allow traffic calming speed tables on a uh, your major causeways, highways, roads, and so right now, as I understand it, it's FDOT's requiring us to pay for the removal. That's correct. And what's that cost? It's about twelve thousand dollars to remove all the rumble strips that are. Well, I'm in favor of this, and um, I think the removal. Yeah. I am too, especially because there's no evidence that the board was even consulted before placing all of these noisy things in front of their building. Commissioner Magazine. Yeah. Um, course in favor of moving this it doesn't seem like a deterrent uh i'd be interested in seeing if you're able to uh use your relations to work with fdot on alternatives 
Um, I understand the challenge of it being a state road, so we could be limited by the options there. Uh, but we can't have something that is providing minimal benefit, but causing maximum damage uh, to our residents. So um, one, in favor of removing these, and then two, hopeful that we can find some sort of uh, better guided alternative. And there's more Madam public Chair. comment. We have three more public comments. If we could hear Otto Izquierdo, if you could please unmute yourself. You have two minutes. Otto? Yep. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. My name is Otto Izquierdo, and I'm the president of the 5825 uh, Association. First of all, thank you to Commissioner Davis uh, Suarez for bringing this on, taking on this, and also special thanks for uh, Commissioner Laura Dominguez for actually coming out here on the time and looking at this and seeing what we have been dealing with for the last three and a half months. Uh, I, I'm just going to express, I have sent emails to you guys explaining this uh, in detail, uh, but I, I just want to uh, mention quickly uh, Will and Alfredo have explained the top five complaints that I have received from many residents. The Rambo strips have created now disturbing noise basically 24-7. It is extremely difficult to sleep at night with this noise. Uh, we have some residents that are even using earplugs to be able to deal with the noise. Uh, some residents have actually closed their shutters uh, uh, during this time to be able to uh, do this even if they have impact windows and they can still hear the noise. And then also, you can't even go out to your balcony because of the loud noise all the time. So these are just some of the complaints and some of the issues. And like Laura mentioned, I have put in my email, this is the same thing that happened in Pine Tree, and they were actually had to be removed. And, you know, when uh, this has been going on now for three and a half months. So I want to thank you for taking on this, and hopefully we can get a quick resolution. Thank you so much. Thank you, Otto. If we could unmute Rich. Rich, you have two minutes. Rich, if you could please unmute yourself. You'll have two minutes to speak. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. I also live at the uh, 5825 uh, Corinthian, and I am also in the back like Alfredo, and I have impact windows, and I'm up 12 floors, and I can also still hear coming through the building from the from the road at night the noise. It just like it keeps going. Fortunately, my bedroom's on the other side. I, I don't hear it as bad. But if I'm in the living room or on the balcony, I can definitely hear the noise coming from the street. And it's just I, I see that most of you seem to be in favor of taking this and and going another route, which I, I appreciate that because the building was not notified. Because if there was, I can guarantee you there would have been 138 units represented uh, there to, to prevent this because we knew what was happening on Pine Tree in the past. And there was no reason to think it would be any worse for us. or not any worse, any better, because our road, Collins, as you know, is a lot busier. And those road bumps, they do no purpose at all. I, I leave for work in the mornings anywhere from 1.30 to 3, and I see these sports cars. They come racing down the road, and so it, they, they, those bumps, it's not even like they're there. So please, I implore of you to, to remove the speed bumps. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have one last caller, Elizabeth Latone. Okay. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we could hear you. Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking this up. Um, I live at 6515 Collins, and I am also, or well, my whole neighborhood actually, up to 71st and 72nd are subject to the racing. It's it's really incredible. Um, I'm in favor of removing those those rumble strips also, but we've got to come up with some sort of, of a solution to this because I, other than having them put maybe in front of the vacant Deauville, which is across from businesses for a temporary measure that could possibly stop them. I don't know, but something has to be done. And we're, we're also, we're also really in favor of safety. And a lady was killed here about two years ago in front of the Publix. Um, so I don't know what, what can be done, but we'd like some help also. 
Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I know that the Corinthian has also been in touch with the uh, Mid Beach Neighborhood Association on this item. And I think uh, Commissioner Fernandez has a comment. Yes. Uh, so, you know, clearly, you know, this has become a quality of life issue for, mm -hmm. for the residents there. Uh, so we I would support uh, any any efforts to, to remove them. What I would say in, in the meantime, perhaps we can speak with our police department to see if speeding is an issue. Uh, you know, how can we get more enforcement in that part of Collins Avenue? We know after 3 p.m. speeding is not an issue because there's probably some sort of gridlock there after a certain time of, of the day. But if we can identify those hours of the day when there is the most speeding uh, and ask our police department once uh, these uh, strips are removed, if they could uh, consider having more enhanced enforcement and speed in, the, in that area, it could help deter. You go by Ball Harbor during certain hours and you don't think uh, speeding because you just know you'll get pulled over. And so maybe, you know, something like that could be done. Excellent comments. Appreciate that. We're all in favor. Yep. Okay, let's move on to yeah, item 17. Madam uh, Chair, if, if I may real quick, we do want to move very quickly on this. Can the motion include taking this recommendation to the February 21st City Commission meeting for endorsement so we can proceed with the removal yes. of the program strips? Thank you. Madam Chair, I need to run inside. Do you mind taking another item? We have 17 is my item. Number 17 is yours? Yes. Okay. Do, uh, Jose, is that okay? Yes. Agree yes. transportation all together so he could leave. Oh, I'll be right back. Okay. So we'll uh, Number four. Okay. Discuss about the potential closure during peak hours of certain city streets and residential areas located immediately north and south of 41st Street between Flamingo Drive and North Bay Road, except for local residents in an effort to improve traffic conditions in residential neighborhoods as well as pedestrian and bicyclist safety. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this item is also sponsored by Commissioner Fernandez. <laughs> okay, no, let's go on to number one, because it has a time certain anyway, and we're behind a little bit. Um, and that is... That is discuss the schedule of major events taking place at Pride Park and how to better activate Pride Park for the maximum benefit of the city residents, as well as your combining item one and ten, right. which is... Discuss Pride Park and the number of activation dates. Right, and so these items were old items. Is that also Alex? Um, no, I'm not sure. One yeah. of them is. One of them is. So the reason why we have these items is because they were old from yep. last year when, um, and they hadn't been heard. Hi, and uh, since then we've had meetings with Palmview and. Uh, there's a different direction that we're moving for Pride Park, but before closing out this item, we do need to hear from Economic Development and Raquel. Good morning, Honorable Chair and Commissioners. Raquel Williams, Assistant City Manager. I'm joined by colleagues in Economic Development, Tourism and Culture, Ovi Park and Recreation, as well as Convention Center Management with us today. So this item has been on the neighborhood's agenda for a while. It's been deferred a few times and we're very eager to have the conversation about Pride Park and activation. I think this item comes as a result of concerns raised by residents in the neighborhood that we wanna do what we can to address this concern while also ensuring that we create balance in the convention center campus, which was not only created and designed to the economic driver for Miami Beach, but also for the region. So Pride Park is 5.8 acres. It used to be a parking lot, bathing area. It was redeveloped as a park. And there are several amenities that are included in the park right now. We're seeing that the shade is increasing in the park with the uh, trees that have recently been added. Uh, we have events that do operate in the park on an annual basis. So for example, the Design Miami event, which is not specifically tied to Miami Beach Convention Center. That is the event with the longest duration in the park. The city recently negotiated a reduction in the number of days from 54 to 50 days. And we also have the boat show, which is activating beginning today, actually, uh, with the first day of the show. Uh, we typically rely on the special event permit process uh, in terms of activations at Pride Park. So if there is an event that is occurring inside of the convention center, 
that is taking up a large amount of space at the convention center and would like to expand, they would go through the special event permitting process in order to activate private parties. So it is not that all events that occur in the convention center would automatically have the ability to go into Pride Park, and there is a special event permitting process that would allow for that. Uh, so currently we have for fiscal year 2024, we have 71 days of activation for what we consider uh, commercial events or events that would require a ticket. Uh, we also have the Pride picnic that will be for two days, so that will bring the total to 73 days of activation. Uh, we also consider that we have to repair the park after the design mining event, and that typically takes anywhere from 10 to 14 days, give or take. Uh, so some of the concerns from the residents that have been brought to our attention uh, include uh, wanting to have more activities at the parks, uh, more activations that are resident and community friendly, and we are uh, planning to put those events together with our parks direct department as well as tourism and culture to create activations that are more in alignment with what the community is seeking to have. We did do a survey uh, recently. Uh, there were 25 respondents uh, from the neighborhood. So we have an idea of the types of activations that are desirable. We also uh, looked at utilization at the park, uh, seeing how many people are there every hour uh, during a period of time last year. Uh, where we saw that people use it for their leisure or walking the dog. We looked at the time of day that people utilize the park. And so what we would like to propose is to have balance in the park. We recognize that there are community needs that are not currently being met. And we would like to have an opportunity to activate the park uh, multiple times a year to have more community activations. Right now, Pride Park is one of several parks in the city that is restricted to 120 days of activation. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're tracking at 73 days for this fiscal year, and so there's still room for more activation, but we don't see uh, that any other event would possibly go into the park this year. Uh, but again, that's that's set by policy, so our special event uh, guidelines, those are approved by commission, and so the commission did authorize for 120 days, or up to 120 days in Pike Park, among other parks in the city. So this is uh, certainly a discussion that, again, we're very eager to have because we would love to have the policy direction on how we move forward with Pride Park. We have been very satisfied with OBG 360, the Convention Center Management Team, and their oversight of Pride Park. They do utilize a city vendor, uh, a third-party vendor, to help maintain the park. Uh, we do have checks and balances in place where we oversee what they are doing uh, in the park, and we have been satisfied. However, there's always room for improvement. We are currently in the process of negotiating an agreement with OVP 360 for their continued management of the Convention Center campus. And we would like to get the direction uh, today that will help inform that negotiation process. I'd like to check with my colleagues. Do you want to hear from the public yeah. first or yes. comment? Um, I think I'd like to hear from the public first. Okay, uh, we have people here in person. And, From uh, Palmview, hi David. Hello, David Greaser, I'm resident of Palmview. I live right across the street, I'm overlooking Pike Park. Uh, thank you guys for taking this item. Very much appreciate it. Uh, when this park was being created, city staff actually came and visited our, our condo. They sat with us. Uh, yeah. We had you know, drinks and snacks, and we looked out over the park and we talked about the details. What year was it? This was 2017, I would say. And it was promised to us this would be a uh, a park that was for residents, primarily for residents, with one exception, which was to allow the Design Miami to go in, because Design Miami had decided that they couldn't fit into the ballroom that was created for them um, at the convention center. Uh, there was also explicitly promised that this park would be under the jurisdiction of Parks and Rec, and it would be utilized as part of Parks and Rec's inventory to serve residents. Uh, at this at this point in time, uh, Pride Park closes every year about October, mid-October, on October 20th. Um, and it's functionally closed through mid-March. There's like a 10-day period where the grass is sort of regrowing um, in between the boat show and the and the uh, the beginning of the end of Design Miami and then the beginning of the boat show. Uh, but we think that we really need to swing this back to be a resident focused park, which is what was originally promised very explicitly. You can actually go through meeting testimony um, where it was said by city staff. Um, and board members that that was what the intention was. 
Uh, and all of my neighbors were at those meetings objecting to um, how the park was visualized. It was originally promised to our neighborhood in 2014 as entirely a 100% park. If you look at those original drawings, it was not optimized for events. It was not a field set up to be a fairgrounds. Um, in reality, we feel like it has really sort of drifted in that direction. It's six acres. Uh, six acres are in the center of the city. We're Barrier Island. We are always you know, desperate for space to do things. So we think this six, six acre space could be much uh, more valuably used you know, with Children's playground equipment, um, Padel courts. I know the Parks and Rec Department is looking for a spot to put a Padel court, um, more pickleball courts, um, all sorts of activations that residents can really use. If you looked at the recent survey that they did, it shows, you know, during the day, essentially nobody uses the park. You know, there's very limited shade um, and outside of the gym, which is somewhat well used, um, there's nothing to do in the park. So I really think that's evidence that it's a, this is a missed opportunity. Um, and it's not what was originally promised to us. Started to so thank you all again. Much appreciated. Thank you, David. Uh, anybody on the phone? We can alternate phones. Yes, uh, we have two callers. We have John Courtney. Okay, caller. Hi, John. Hi, good morning. Thank you guys for hearing this issue. Um, I think we're all sort of on the same page here with uh, what Dave has already shared around the history and sort of the broken promises. Um, but I just wanted to address the OBG management and this this relationship of economic development, hiring out a private company to manage a public park. And I, I think, unfortunately, the result is that this is just the worst run, least activated park in our city. And it's 5.8 acres in the, the center of our of our city. And it's just really unfortunate uh, that that's where we have arrived. And I think as much as I you know, appreciate Raquel's um, good intentions here, you just can't have a private company. Um, who's more interested in profit and reducing costs, optimizing a park for the public. And so I think there's not really an opportunity to move forward there and that this does need to move to the Parks Department. I also think it's important for everyone to recognize that we're not asking for a change here. We're just asking staff to live up to the promises that were made. Um, and we're asking the commissioners to direct staff to transfer the management to the Parks Department and to stop holding conventions in the park altogether. So I appreciate you all discussing this item today. Anybody else in person want to be addressed? Alberto Concha, I live in Panview uh, for 23 years. Uh, yeah, no, the park, you know, it should be, I don't know, for the people that are right there. I think this is uh, in uh, issues a little bit, uh, but we can have some events, but not all the time. I mean, traffic is, gets hard or whatever. And for us, it's just not a good thing. Thank you, Alvaro. Anybody else on Zoom? We have one more caller on Zoom. Patrick. Hi, Patrick. Hi, thanks for uh, taking this point again. My name is Patrick Breshik. I live across the street from Pride Park, currently looking at billboards for uh, progressive insurance. Right now, the park, from the pedestrian perspective, is just billboards for advertisements for the boat show sponsors. And it's really not a public space uh, like the rest of our parks are. Um, so I would encourage you to give the management of this public space back to the parks department um, because they do such a great job in our other areas. They've really increased um, the, the space on top of the parking garage is now some pickleball courts, which is really great and used, which has been, um, you know, we have about 40 people that play there on the weekends, which it was currently or before that, it was just an empty parking lot with a few city parking um, cars, city parked cars. So um, I would uh, just encourage everyone to please give this back to the Parks Department and make it a resident-focused area again. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I ask Yes, Vice Chair. May I ask a question for- Of um, course. Uh, the caller, uh, Patrick, brings up a good point on general prohibition on advertising signs. So, um, you know, because this was brought to my attention on an email do we have, is there a language that, that says we're allowed to have advertising on the parks, I guess, during these big events? Sure. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members, Lisa Arrogante, Director of Tourism and Culture for the City of Miami Beach. So there is language, uh, and I can state that directly in our code, Section 12-5 for special event permits. The second line says a special event is defined as a temporary use on public or private property that would not be permitted generally or without restriction throughout a particular zoning district. 
but would be permanent if controlled with a special review in accordance with the section. But that leads me to our special event guidelines on section E of the guidelines regarding event signage. It says sponsorship, banners, and signage are allowed with the designated event site only and may be displayed only during the event. Banners must be immediately removed from the site following the event. And so with large scale events that we have like in Leeds Park and Pride Park, it's customary for them to have signage, temporary signage, you know, with their event sponsorship. So um, during the special event review process, we take special attention, we look at controversial subject matter, you know, obviously anything that's offensive, gambling, alcohol, you know, that type of, you know, substances that we would not allow. But as far as sponsors, if you go to any event, you see Goya, you know, anything, it's nothing offensive. Um, so I'm reading it. It says the special public event sponsor shall be responsible for providing acceptable proof of insurance and indemnification. The name of a company or product providing sponsors sponsorship may be prominent feature of the sign. Yes. However, general, is that I guess that's the the provision. Yes. But there's like I mean, because I live across the street in Bright Park, there's sure. I mean, the, all the whole fence is basically an advertising, maybe with sections of green in between. So who's to decide how many signs are? The how many signs of yeah, how many signs of advertising? Logo? There's no specific uh, direction of how many signs you can have. If you look at the sign, it does include also QR codes that have directional mapping where to get tickets, and it does have uh, some breaks in between with some greenery imagery and logo. But there's no specific number that to answer your question. There's no number specific of how many. Uh, logos you can have. Basically. Yeah, because it says, you know, mm -hmm. it's a product open. providing maybe a prominent, maybe a prominent feature of the sign. Mm -hmm. However, general advertising signs are not permitted. So where it says, however, general advertising signs are not permitted, that's in section E. So how does that jive with each other? So the special event permit would allow for that the temporary signage, which includes that. Interesting. Commissioner Fernandez. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for, for calling this item. I placed this item on the on the agenda uh, because this is a good opportunity to look at the uh, number of activation days. When we look at our special events uh, guidelines, there's areas of our city where we've set a 120 day cap for special event activations. And it's and as is described in the memorandum, it includes areas like the Loomis Park Beachfront, Collins Avenue, uh, the Collins Avenue Corridor, Ocean Terrace. What I find unique in those areas is that those are the MXE zoned areas of our city, the areas of our city for mixed use entertainment districts. Those are the areas that that perhaps are more uh, are, are are better suited for traditionally historically. Uh, for, for for this type of activity. Once you go further inland and more into the residential areas of, of our city, such as Pride Park, you're surrounded by residential multifamily zoning right at its periphery. And then you go into more residential zoning uh, further, further in, which is why it's worthy of further analysis to, to consider whether this specific should have more limited activation days uh, than other parks because it is further into our residential areas in, in, in the city. Um, as part of this item, um, I'm also concerned that, uh, that not only are we currently allowing up to 120 days of, uh, of activation in a, in a fiscal year in Pride Park when it's so close to residentially sold property, but I'm further concerned that at some point we're gonna be we're we're gonna have the Grand uh, Hyatt Hotel built, and I'm concerned that once that's built, there could potentially be a bigger demand for activation days on Pride Park, which will ultimately um, affect the quality of life of the residents uh, that 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 live around Pride Park and limit the general public's use of Pride Park. With that in mind, I'd like to give, I'd like for, for the committee to consider making a recommendation to perhaps 
reduce the number of activation days uh, in, in Pride Park, uh, maybe a maximum of 75 days uh, might be prudent. That way we can still accommodate uh, the Miami International Boat Show. That way we can still accommodate the Sun Miami, but also still accommodate the residential use of the park, still accommodate the quality of life of our residents. And additionally, I'd like for us to consider designating an area on the western edge, or the western edge of, of the park that remains free of activation so that the residents not only have an area that they can use, but they also have a buffer, a little bit of, of, of an added buffer from the activations that go in, in the park. So uh, that's 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 part of the material that I'd like for the committee to consider in its recommendation to the city commission. Um, I think I think it's one of the things that we can do to to to, to make sure that there is uh, a good relationship between the convention center, which the, this park is a part of the convention center facilities, but it maintains a good relationship with the neighboring press. Okay, Commissioner Magazine. Yeah, I guess where I'm going with this is. I just think we need to do a better job of striking that proper balance. I think if we put a hard, fast stop on, it seems like we're kind of right up against the number of activation days right now. No, uh, the proposed like 75. Right. right. That would preclude us from using the park for those unticketed, open, free community activations. Um, if, if we were to program the park beyond the existing ticketed activations, we would Hit a wall. And maybe, John, if you could answer this, uh, sorry to catch you off guard here, but six acres, that's absent the golf courses and Flamingo Park, the largest park that we have in our city? It's on the larger side. I mean, yeah, yes, yeah. absent the yeah. Little Miss, North Beach, yes. Ocean Side Park, it's, it's and, and the larger one. I mean, looking at an aerial map, it's, it's amongst the least dense residential areas here. You, you, you are boarded by several multifamily buildings uh, just on the west, but absent that, then your boundaries are the convention center, the botanical garden, Miami Beach City Hall. I think that's a larger reason why we're not seeing a lot of activation. And when we talk about, well, maybe we'd see more uh, utilization of the park if we activated it, that would be a hard balance to strike because all of a sudden if we're sitting there building children's playgrounds. I'm the father of a six-year-old. I, I think we, we uh, have plenty of opportunity to expand uh, utilizations like that. But there wouldn't allow for any activation during our Basel or the boat show or things like that. If we have Pidel courts, those are mobile. You can't pick those up during our Basel or Design Miami and say, okay, we're moving the children's playground, right? It's It's some of an all or nothing in terms of utilization. So it does seem as if the option here is to either have this as a fully active utilized park uh, with playgrounds and Pinnell courts or to have it as a passive park that is able to strike this kind of better balance. Right, um, children's playground, but yeah, you're not gonna pick that up. However, the wall um, Pinnell courts can be constructed in a way that they can go up and down. Uh, but not children playgrounds, but these other amenities, picnic shelters, trees, obviously. And, and from your professional uh, viewpoint, are there ways where we're kind of leaving some low hanging fruit on the table about how to turn, uh, how to turn around the activation to returning it to uh, our it's called quote unquote residential park? So the resodding, uh, are there things that we could explore? that will essentially accelerate that process. Um, this is not my expertise, but instead of having to resod every time, put down some sort of uh, uh, rubber ground. It, that's obviously not a, a real a solution, but things along those lines where we can essentially become more efficient at the turnaround time from uh, activating this park for commercial venues to returning it to uh, what the park's intended for. Right. We have not explored those options outside of natural sod, which you see the time yeah. to make that happen. However, we've directed so we, we but you know, we've never looked at those different options. Right, um, I think we, I, I think we should not lose sight of the fact that you know a lot of the previous callers stated that what was sold to them in the community is 
it's one thing and what they got is something completely different you know um i live across the street from pride park and it is it is probably the least the least resident friendly part in the city um uh, you know the center of the park is has this mixed match of grass and then concrete walkway and so if you wanted to run your dog for example or, or you run yourself with your dog you're gonna you're gonna trip over concrete and then going back onto uh, onto grass and not not to mention that in the heat of the summer there's literally no shade at all in the center of the park and that's that's the majority of the area it, it certainly seems like that park isn't really a park it's more of like a staging ground for um for events and so what i have a problem with is you know i've i've walked i've watched the um the history recordings on this subject and uh, the way it was promised to the residents is is not what it is now and i know you're not you don't run the park right it parks department doesn't run pride park it's ovg right correct we provide professional oversight to assist the contract management okay and then you know like i i maybe a month ago after the design miami I was walking my dog and, and there was this oily film substance on, on the on the sidewalk or on the, I guess, the rotunda. And it was there for like a week until I had to call and say, hey, you know, what, it, this is still filthy. And next day it was clean, but it, it certainly seems that no one is really paying attention to detail um, at that park. And what is there now isn't very... I guess resident friendly and look I, I understand it's the least dense uh part of of the city um in terms of residential however you know we, we there is a large community i mean there's, there's um palm view and then there's bay shore um you know I, there's going to be on meridian just north of there so um you know i i think you know, I to, to be frank, I I I have an item on this up, upcoming meeting, and I don't know if I can speak on that item today. It kind of dovetails exactly with this. Uh, report. Where do you want to go with this one? Um, I'm going to. Well, I'm going to hear what the uh, Stefan. Rest of my colleagues have to say about this. Sorry, I just I don't want to repeat anything. I'm Stefan right. Jenez. I'm. Uh, resident at, uh, Mich on Michigan Avenue. I'm also the president of Palm View. Um, I don't want to repeat anything that was said so far, and, and I agree with that. And I really appreciate also that all of you have showed very strong interest in helping out on this situation. The only thing I would like to add is like, I, I think we're here today simply because some opportunities were missed before. And I'm just not going back in time. But um, for example, when the, the the contract got came up for renewal for Design Miami. Um, we were not informed about this. The reason why we found out is because John was on the call, was able to find this item in the consent agenda, and we were able to ask you to pull that item so we could at least be able to be part of the discussion. So if this would have happened, the Design Miami uh, renewal would have gone through with no discussion at all. We had finally a discussion with this with staff, and it, it was kind of a more listening uh, discussion. We were told that, hey, Design Miami doesn't have anything with this, and uh, please let it go through. We did, because we are nothing to do. We have nothing against the Design Miami. We have nothing against the boat show, but enough is enough. After that, let's not add some more to this. That discussion never happened. We're in February. This was discussed in September. We've never heard back from staff. Just want to bring up also some other situation that happened where I, I don't think that the management of the park is done the, the best possible way right now. When they resorted after the um, after the design Miami, um, this was done and almost finished on December 31st. And because the two workers were not want to work um, during the weekend, so we went through New Year's Eve and, and uh, you know, that big weekend with the sod not being finished. That event was the first week of December. So at the end of December, so technically by January 1st, the sodding was not finished. 
because nobody's pushing, nobody's supervising. Like uh, um, Commissioner Suarez said, he had to intervene to, to talk about this. Why isn't this cleaned up? I want to bring up another example. We have, and you pay for a beautiful restroom facility that is always in close. We're unable to manage and have a park with a restroom facility. Some other um, parks are pushing to have restrooms, like we're talking about at Alton Road and Fifth. We have them and they've been closed all the time. I couldn't tell you what it looks like mm -hmm. inside. This is getting to a point where we're really concerned about this. So we feel very uncomfortable what happened with the renewal of Design Miami. And now the other deadline is happening is a renewal of the contract with the, the convention center. So what I'm asking you is please do not let this contract go through until we come up with something that everybody feels comfortable with. Because this is a BD out of it. Okay, I think we need to close out this item because it's been on for a year and well, Vice Chair Suarez has uh, an item at the next commission meeting on this topic Madam for us Chair. to review. Rick, help. I just wanted to ask for an opportunity to give some clarification and we also do have a general manager of the convention center here with us. Uh, uh, Commissioner Suarez, to your point about the issue with the side, you did bring that, uh, you, you did forward an email and I did let you know that it was already scheduled to be repaired and replaced. So that didn't happen as a result of your communication, but it was already scheduled. I think one of the missteps that we had in that moment was not having some signage out to say, hey, this is still being, you know, repaired and replaced and, you know, basically part of our dust. And I think that's what we can do better going forward. Um, I do want to, if you would allow our general manager of the convention center to come forward, if if you would like that, if not, one minute. Freddie. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, general public. My name is Freddie Peterson. Uh, I probably manage the Miami Beach Convention Center in its campus on behalf of the city of Miami Beach. I do want to say as a resident, by the way, I really appreciate commissioners and the city for all that we do on behalf of the residents. Um, point well taken. Uh, there's always room for improvement. I, I really appreciate the feedback. Um, we do have a contractor as a general landscaping that we work with through the city of Miami Beach on uh, taking any corrective measures uh, as soon as possible when they identify. Um, it is a bit of a tricky balancing act. And we, we've said that term a couple of times here today um, when you're talking about resodding or power washing, etc. It does take a little bit of time because um, you're also looking at underground uh, utility damages, et cetera. So uh, we're actually trying to, we are pushing the landscaping contractor to mobilize a lot quicker, to finish in that space a lot quicker. And then also the power washing, again, uh, Commissioner Suarez, they mentioned that, and I've even seen it myself, I'm much more aggressive on the power washing side of things when it comes to the sidewalks and those spaces, not only to SFM landscaping, because it's built into there, uh, contract to do that at least four times a year, but even our staff. So again, taking more of an initiative and a more aggressive approach, if you will, um, in this uh, project. So, um, I don't know if there's any questions uh, through the chair or anybody else that I can, um, you know, uh, provide some additional feedback. Um, and again, working through the city, uh, with the community, with the neighborhood, the residents, I'm more than happy to strike that balance as we keep saying here uh, when it comes to this space. Uh, Vice Chair? I, I don't want to I don't want to take so much more time on this. Mm -hmm. I think I know you're ready to move on. Um, you know, I, I think I think we should, I, I, like I said, I have an item on, on the 21st to discuss this. And I, I want I wanted to check everyone's temperature on this. I'm glad Alex is here. You know, I um, what I would propose is, you know, we have two events that are a long-standing, um, a, a long-standing tradition in my boat show, right, which is right now, and Design Miami. How would how would my colleagues feel if we capped it at only those two events, and any other future events that we want to do just has to go through a regulatory process where it has community input, maybe comes to the neighborhoods uh, committee, and and then. You know, start the the transition from a commercial park to a real residential park. 
A hundred percent, because I have looked at the videos as well. The park was never intended to be a commercial or part of the campus of the convention center. I understand that it was a parking lot before, mm -hmm. but every committee and commission meeting discussion said that this was a park for the residents. So anything uh, moving forward would have to go through the Palm View neighborhood to see if it's acceptable to them. Um, and I'd like to move on. Madam Chair, if I may. There. Thank you. Um, that's exactly the intent of this item. It hasn't been on committee for a year, Madam Chair. It's been here since September. Uh, oh, it said February uh, uh, of 23. February, I, made the referral, I made the referral I made the referral September 13th, 2023. And the purpose of the referral, and I quote, was to was to further define a more resident accessible policy for a private park, and specifically for this committee to consider whether amendments may be appropriate to reduce the amount of special event activation days while continuing to accommodate signature events such as Design Miami and the Boat Show. Um, and and I asked the the, the committee uh, to 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 place reasonable limits on days that Pride Park can be used as an event space. I think uh, based on the feedback. That we've received today, I I think we should make a recommendation uh, that 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 event activation days be limited uh, to no more than that that seventy five days. That 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 there be um, that there be space designated for residential use, even when you have activations, so that residents are not completely blocked from from the park when boat show is there. Or when uh, the sign Miami is there, I think there's cats already right now, aren't there? It's 120 days, okay. and that was my point earlier. 120 days is what we have in the mixed use entertainment district, but this is the heart of our residential area. This is bordered by RM2 zoning, and then you go further in, you have residential single family zoning, and then you cross uh, Dade Boulevard, and whenever you have an activation there. The people whose quality of life are being impacted are the residents of Palm View and the residents of What's Bayshore. in the contract for Design Miami and uh, the boat show? So is, is it it's a big less thing. than 120? So it's 50 days in the Design Miami contract. The boat show activation days are 21 days. So this fiscal year, we're looking at ticketed events at 71 days. Okay, and what Commissioner Fernandez is saying is fair. Uh, how do you guys feel about it, the rest I mean, of the committee? I, I mean, yes, but there has to be some sort of process where it can't just be a hard, hard limit where Agreed. it has to be the economic development team or, or the convention center would come and say, hey, we have this signature event. We just heard today, Commissioner Fernandez, BOSHA brings $30 billion of economic activity to our region. Um, so those are very real numbers. So, yes. Let's be sure that we're not just opening the floodgates for anything. And I agree that we need to essentially be more resident focused on this. Uh, we can roll back that cap, but there has to be some yeah. sort of, I don't want to say appeals process, but um, some sort of way where uh, Raquel and the convention center team can come in and run it through a committee where the committee is actually tasked with going out and reaching out to Palm View and saying, hey, we're going to start this process of working together with you because so Parks are great. I think having the Design Miami and the Boat Show in our backyards are also great. So we wouldn't want to miss out on the next signature event um, with a hard and fast rule. So let's really engage the community. And, 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 I, and, and I think to through the chair to, to, to my colleague's point, certainly, you know, we always establish caps, but the city commission always has the authority that if there's, you know, a not one off event that 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 we desire to approve, that that can always be approved by the city commission. And so I would encourage the the committee to recommend a 75 day cap that anything outside of that, you know, you you have, you know, someone's party or you have a one day volleyball tournament that it be able to be to be brought to the city commission for approval by the city commission. But these uh, 75 other days of activation, that doesn't require city commission approval. Um, but once you hit that cap and you have this, this you know, one-off event, okay, we bring that to the city commission. And if it's reasonable, we approve it. And if it's not reasonable, we don't approve it. And perhaps one of the things that we can do to ensure 
proper notification to the residents is that we make that type of item a resident's right to know item so that the abutting associations, whether it be Palmview, uh, Bayshore, or, or even Collins Park, so that, so that they're notified of this. So I would urge the committee to make that open up the bathrooms as part of the recommendation. And the last thing that I would ask is let's ask the Parks Department to study what type of temporary shade structure could be installed in the park so that when the park is not being activated with special events, the residents have some sort of shade there because it does get very, very I, I, they, they were playing their pickleball once and I went there once and it was just too hot. Okay, so now to close this out, so the recommendation will be to uh, open up the park for 75 days. This will go back to the commission. You mean limit and then the bathrooms. You mean limit from 120 limit to Limit from 120 to 75, and then open up the bathroom. Just for clarification, are those 75 days for ticketed activations, or if parks and rec or tourism and culture? Ticketed. Okay, so if, if there are events open to the public that are community-centered events, they would not fall within that 75 how do you feel? We're okay as long as there's a process that is approved, that is going through the commission, like uh, the commissioners recommended. We have no problem. We want to be informed. And right. Plenty of time to look at. Are we okay, committee? The, the, with that the only thing, the only thing with yeah. the bathroom is, I would caution. The bathrooms are closed for a reason. I'm assuming, and 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 right now, are those bathrooms controlled by OBG or Parks Department? Yeah. They're controlled by OBG, and they have been closed due to public safety issues related to homeless and. We shared that publicly before at a prior meeting. Uh, we could explore having the bathrooms open for a certain time period of day. There would be a physical impact, and we could relay that to the commission. Well, well what I was going to say is, I think Parks runs a pretty good operation on when to close bathrooms and when to open it. So I don't necessarily want to. I don't know if I want OBG determining when bathrooms should be open or closed. So maybe we should let staff come back with recommendations. Um, Sounds good. Uh, on, on, the, on the bathroom, because that can open up a whole can of water. 100%. And the city would tell OBG when we want the bathroom to open. We have contract oversight. Parks and Rec is very much included in that as well. Okay. So we could always Thank direct you. them. Do you okay. have that, Stephanie? So I have the items concluded. The, okay. We're going to recommend the limiting the days. Thank and you. Going back, and you have an item on the 21st. Can we go back to number 17? And that's uh, Commissioner Fernandez's item. Yes. I You and I are going to be the, the prolific item. I don't even know if I have anything. But I'm well, also because meeting. Well, these are oh, okay. So, um, Madam Chair, I place this item uh, on the agenda because with the implementation of the Better Bus Networks, we've seen an elimination. Uh, uh, yeah, an, an elimination of of certain of certain routes. Um, one of the uh, discontinued routes uh, was uh, was route um, route one fifteen, um, and uh, and route route one fifteen provided southbound service uh, from uh, from North Beach all the way down towards Alter Road and towards uh, Mount Sinai. Um, it also provided uh, service uh, from from Lincoln Road and Washington Avenue to Mount Sinai as well. And what's what what's ended up happening is that it's made it more difficult for individuals who live in North Beach who want to access Mount Sinai. It's also made it more difficult, let's say, for 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 individuals who live in North Beach who want to access the the airport express bus. Um, you know, these are important connections. Mount Sinai is not only a medical facility, it's one of our major employers here, here in, in Miami Beach. 41st Street uh, is a center of commerce in, in, our, in our city. Um, and, and, and not giving uh, our residents a, a route that connects them to Route 150 that provides that airport express connection not only hurts our residents, but also hurts the individuals who work in our businesses. Because a lot of the people who take the airport express, that 150 route, are not just people leaving Miami Beach, but they're individuals who take that bus route to come into Miami Beach and then need a connection to get 
from there to North Beach and other places of employment. And so I made this, this, this referral to see how we could expand, expand that connectivity, perhaps some realignment of existing tro tro trolley routes during certain peak hours uh, so that we can reestablish that connection between North Beach and Mount Sinai and the uh, and, and the Miami Beach uh, Airport Express bus. Excellent point. I've heard uh, from many residents uh, in North Beach and actually even in South Beach as well yep. that can't get to Mount Sinai because uh, the bus that used to go on Alton for West Avenue residents was eliminated and now they have to walk to Washington and taking the South Beach loop hasn't been an option for them to get there. But anyway, the point here is North Beach and our Director of Transportation, Jose, is here to talk more. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Jose Gonzalez, Transportation and Mobility Director, for the record. Um, so as, as we mentioned, um, on November 13th, the county initiated the Better Bus Network. And as of that date, November 13th, we launched an expanded on-demand freebie service that serves the, uh, the portion in North Beach that was previously served by Route 150. We had various discussions with the county in terms of what the what the right vehicle should be, how many vehicles. Initially, we proposed two vehicles. Let me take a step back. Initially, we actually proposed uh, our trolleys, trolley service. We then proposed, and to which the county, uh, the county did not support that idea. We then proposed an on-demand type of service. And the county was more receptive to a first mile, last mile solution. We proffered two additional vehicles to try to satisfy the demand. The county agreed to only one. And they, they memorialized that in a letter that they sent, that they sent to us uh, back on uh, October 11th of last year. That they, in fact, it, the letter is titled enhanced freebie service because that would be the only option that the, that the county would support and then the county moved forward with an interlocal agreement which went to the city commission for approval for one additional vehicle that the county would pay for that additional vehicle was placed into service on november 13th the same day that the route 115 was eliminated when the better bus was, uh, was implemented and we've been tracking ridership since that date and what we've found is that during the off-peak times, the demand is satisfied. The additional vehicle does well during the non-peak times. However, during the peak times, morning morning uh, rush and afternoon rush, when people are trying to get to the hospital, because they're, you know, they're, they're, they work there, and then in the afternoons trying to get back home, that is when we've been seeing wait times um, reaching up to one hour reaching up to 60 minutes, which which we all know is, is not acceptable. So- and Jose, what's the recommendation? So one of the things we wanted to do was share with the county this data. Now that since November 13th, we've been collecting this data. So we wanted to share this with them because we think collaboratively we could come up with a better solution. Yeah. Uh, whether that solution is to add more on demand more freebie vehicles or uh, uh, some sort of an option where our trolleys can potentially be realigned, we would need to discuss that with them. Because even the trolley option, they would need to approve, particularly if they're, if they're, if they're funding. And at the end of the day, we're going to need an agreement with them. So they would need to be supportive of whatever option uh, we decide. So the recommendation good. here is to provide the analysis uh, for an expanded uh, freebie? Well, and, 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 and Madam Chair, um, I'm not sure if if expanding freebie during peak hour would be sufficient. I would, um, I think perhaps during you know non peak hours freebie might be fine. The problem is during peak hours we know wait times are up to one hour of the individuals who know that the freebie is there, because there might be individuals who go to the bus stop. Who might not even know that uh, that that there's a freebie option, and and so and, and, and so this is of the customers that know that we have a freebie service. 
in that peak hour, the wait hours are are up to what one hour, and there might be a whole segment of consumers. So a bigger trolley. I don't understand what the recommendation well, is. Well, well, well. The freebie is a car, and I don't think a car is really what we need during peak hours. We need to encourage individuals to use public transit, and I don't think we're we're going to achieve that during peak hours with a freebie. I would like for us to explore what expanded uh, trolley service we can provide. Uh, during during peak hours, you know, reach out to the county. Certainly, share with them this this data. Um, certainly, wait times of up to one hour during peak dur during peak time. I don't think achieves the efficiencies that the Better Bus Network was was seeking to 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 achieve. And the most important thing for the for the success of any plan like this is adaptation. We implement something, and we hope it'll be successful and we'll achieve the goals that we aim to achieve. But we have to be willing and able to adapt to what the implementation tells us is, is necessary in order to be successful. And so um, I would reach out to the county, share the data with them, let them know our request of possibly uh, expanding the trolley service during the peak hour so we can better reduce okay. that one hour wait time. Excellent. Do we have public comment? We do not. Okay, uh, I am in favor of that recommendation. What do my colleagues feel? Yeah, of course, it's in the move it, it, Okay, camera. let's close this one out. That's number That's 17. Six. Number Maybe four. Thank you, Lizette. <laughs> number four was deferred. So was deferred. Oh, deferred, okay. Yeah. You're deferring number four? Yes. I thought I had number number You're deferring number 25. Why? Yeah, why was it deferred? I thought at one point we had already discussed this at committee, and I think the old committee didn't feel comfortable with this idea. Certainly, if this committee I was more, I think if you guys want to. Want to talk about yeah. yeah. Okay, let's do it. Let's bring it up. Okay, so the number right. four. Yes. Uh, you need to call the item. I, I will call the item number item number four discussion of potential closure during peak hours of certain city streets and residential areas located immediately north and south of 41st Street between Flamingo Drive and North Bay Road, except for local residents in an effort to improve traffic conditions in residential neighborhoods as well as pedestrians and bicyclists safety. And Commissioner Fernandez, this is your item. Yeah, I'll I'll tell you. Um there's grid law. There are, there are certain periods of, of the year after 3 p.m. There's total grid lock uh, in, uh, in, throughout our city. Uh, and, and, and you see it worse in residential neighborhoods where individuals can't, can't back out of their driveways. They can't exit their homes. They feel trapped in their, in, in their homes. Um, you know, this item, I, I brought forward this, this item at, at, at the time to see, okay, is there anything that we can limit the amount of cut through traffic? Um, you know, a lot of times you see trucks, you see construction workers, you see deliveries cutting through these neighborhoods. And it's very frustrating to, um, to, 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 to those residents who not only are trapped in, in their homes, but individuals trying to get home and like for me, I, I live within this area as well. It could take me sometimes 30 minutes to get from City Hall to the corner of Chase and Alton. That's insane. That is insane. I don't know if this necessarily is a solution. I have put it on the agenda last time. I know last time, last committee, uh, the last composition of the committee didn't feel comfortable with this idea. It seems like, I don't know how this committee might feel about it. I was ready. I was ready to defer the item, but I would mm -hmm. certainly welcome the feedback of my colleagues. Uh, Vice Chair Suarez. Yes. Uh, can I actually just say something first? Of course. We have some input on this. And I think this is what happened at the last committee discussion of this, too. We, we, we sort of closely researched this issue, and there are two Florida Attorney General opinions, which are not binding on the city, but they're highly persuasive legal authority mm -hmm. that say that the city cannot close res a street to residents home. Uh, you can, according to Florida statutes, uh, restrict a street for a special occasion, like during boat show, if everybody was going into a neighborhood, you could close that to residents for a day or two. But to say that at certain times or even for the whole day, 
uh, every day yep. that uh, that the street is only going to be open to residents of that street. Uh, that has been at two different times the attorney general has opined that's not Madam contemplated. Chair. Madam Chair, that's, that's exactly what I was going to suggest. Um, I, I don't know about every day, but I think I, I'd love to see everyone's temperature on high impact weekends because, you know, we live in the area and during, uh, for example, our puzzle, I yeah. mean, it was if you couldn't you couldn't move and, you know, everyone is trying to take a side street thinking that it's a quicker way. And then the residential neighborhoods get clogged up. Everything's clogged up. So at least keep the residential neighborhoods open. So I'd love to see what everyone would think about during high impact weekends um, where we, we do we would we would basically limit that to residential uh, use only similar. How do we do in like South of Fifth? And Bellevue, we do it now exactly. for the boat yeah. for our yeah. Basel. So, you know, Bayshore, I should, I, I believe should also be afforded that, um, you know, that, that privilege of having access for residents only during like super high impact weekend. And Mr. Vice Chair, and north of 41st Street as well. We have neighborhoods north of 41st Street that experience the yeah. same the same traffic. Uh and so and, and so uh I most certainly do think high impacts I think uh is is reasonable. But I think Rob that's something that you had brought up at committee last night that if it's a temporary matter, not a permanent regulation, but a temporary matter uh yes. during a high so like both show is considered high impact. I don't know if it's considered high impact, but it is a time period. And Memorial Day is a time period which of course is high impact and we I, I think staff could be tell you more, but we do we do that in certain areas. We close off neighborhoods uh, to vehicular traffic, except for residents. In when I lived in Flamingo Park neighborhood, uh, that was done. Um, and so, yes, we, we could definitely do whether you want to call it high impact, whether you want to call it just to designate which events yeah. you want to do it for. However, you want to say it. If it's on a temporary as needed basis for something like a very uh, you know, high impact event, that would be fine. You just can't do it every day. Right. Well, Commissioner like, Magazine. Yeah, I just want to be really careful with the unintended consequences here. Fine to try to solve some sort of uh, yes. pilot flexible basis, but um, we have to be very flexible with how we react to this. We, we don't want to create more problems. Uh, out of this. I agree, Vice Chair. Do you have anything else to share? Yeah, so I, I, I like them. I guess if we want to explore this further, would we just go back to transportation and ask them to come back to us with uh, recommendations on, um, on, on specifically the area that Commissioner Fernandez has pointed out during high impact weekends. Uh, I'd like to make that. Uh, Can we move it to the commission so we get it out of committee and have them present their recommendation there? I'll make that motion. Okay, all and, in favor? And, and Madam, Madam Chair, yes. if you would allow, uh, if I could just, since this is my item to continue working with the administration, with the transportation department, maybe identify those Thank events you. and the specific geographic area. Thank you, Commissioner. For sure. We'll bring All it right. Back. So now we can move we on to my, uh, number uh, eight. Yeah, it's your yeah. item. Well, okay. We have number item number eight is parking. The discussion regarding parking enforcement on bicycle days. And Monica Beltran will be presenting the item. I think she is just making her way through our transition rooms. Who's <laughs> <laughs> that? Good morning, Hi. Madam Commissioner. Commissioner Alberto Ventura, Assistant Parking Director. This item was first heard, a brief history of this item. It was first heard on December 22nd, on December 7th of 22, and this committee. This is an item from Commissioner Fernandez who raised concerns of the bike lanes. He requested that we add dedicated personnel to enforce. We have been enforcing since January of 2023. To date, we have issued 275 violations for bike lanes. In addition, we have also issued over 7,000 for vehicles obstructing traffic, which the officer has the discretion to issue in the order. So I'm sorry, can you repeat the numbers again? Um, for bicycle 
lane violations, 275. Right. So for obstructing traffic, 7,074. Okay. So let me ask you this. Uh, what is the best way? Because I think, I think um, residents a lot of times, you know, see UPS trucks blocking, blocking a bicycle lane. Mm -hmm. They'll see uh, a FedEx truck. Uh, or Amazon. What's the best way for residents to to report this when they're seeing this? They could report it to our parking dispatch, which we're open twenty four seven. We can we can provide the phone number that they could that they can call. But we have dedicated officers. When it's a when it's a UPS truck, something like that, since those are considered freight vehicle, then instead of issuing one of these two violations, they are issued a right away fine, which is a five hundred dollar fine for the person. And uh, we have safe routes to schools. Uh, for example, Prairie Avenue goes to Miami Beach uh, Senior High, and then we have uh, uh, Nautilus as well and, and, and other schools. Do we have dedicated enforcement certain time periods to ensure that these bicycle lanes are un un unobstructed when kids are typically going to school or going back home from school? During the morning, we have at least one to two officers that we assign to, to drive through those areas. Okay. All right. And we will continue to to assign officers. And Thank you, Alberto. So is there a recommendation here? No, I wanted an update. Item? Wonderful update. update. Thank you. Uh, we're going to close it out and move on to the next item. Okay. I appreciate that. That's such a oh, was there any public comment? We have one public comment. Call there in okay. user two. One minute. We could unmute. You have one minute. And please announce your name for the record. Hi, thank you. This is Matthew Galtana. And I want to thank Commissioner Fernandez for, again for bringing this item. I remember when it was heard. Uh, last year, and uh, as the past chair of the city's transportation, parking, and bicycle pedestrian facilities committee, I worked with Alberto and the parking department to try to help prioritize the enforcement of people who are stopping in bicycle lanes. I have to say that like 270, I think I heard over the last year, is really a low number. When I ride every day around, whether I'm taking my kids to school or going to work or going to the store, I see dozens almost a day, uh, people who are stopped in bike lanes. And many times they could have just pulled to the curb and they wouldn't be blocking the bicycle lane. So I think that, uh, you know, with perhaps more direction could be given, maybe more resources allocated to get our bicycle lanes that are on the street, um, you know, more resources allowed, allocated to increase the enforcement and the education as well. It's not just giving a punitive ticket, but it's educating as to why uh, why these bicycle lanes need to be kept clear so that they're able to use. You know, these are used by, by people of all ages, all abilities, and right now, many situations, it's just, an, it's just unsafe. So I appreciate, again, the initiative that's been taken and that maybe it could be stepped up a couple notches. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, so we'll close out this just, item. And, and just a question, because I know, I know we have uh, four certified uh, Parking enforcement officers assigned to a uh, bicycle unit. We have more than we. After this item was first heard, we have like five more officers okay. that we have certified. But I've never seen a parking enforcement officer on a bicycle. Well, normally what they'll do is they'll leave the office in the bike, and, and the bike is on the truck, and then they park, and then they'll use the bike. Okay. How and often are they doing this? Should be they Should be. How often are they doing it? I should, should, but how often are they doing it? I, I will look into it, but it's supposed to be they, that they're supposed to assign an office, whether it's on a bike or on a vehicle that they are supposed to assign. Okay, uh, because that was my, my, my request as part of this, of this item was specifically, I want to see parking enforcement officers on bicycle lanes throughout the city we have a lot of city we should have at any given time always at least i think at least one one parking enforcement officer on the bicycle lane so so with that uh i'm thank just gonna thank you thank you and i agree 100 okay the item is closed uh 25 all right we have item number 20 oh, 25 was deferred as per commissioner Fernandez. we're going to listen to item number five which is building discuss the quarterly building update and we have, I believe, Natasha presenting the item from building. 
Hi, good morning, Commissioners. Natasha Diaz, Thank Building you. Department Assistant Director. This item is a quarterly update to inform the Commission on any updates or streamlining effort that the Building Department has made. Uh, today's update will be on the first quarter of the fiscal year and really a little recap of the past whole year, but I'll keep it brief to highlight some impactful ones. In the past year, all the departments involved in the development process, permitting process, have worked together and with an outside consultant to identify bottlenecks and develop improvement strategies. This is an ongoing effort amongst all these departments, and there is an item at the next finance committee to provide the commission with an update on the actions taken from the recommendation from the consultant. Some other items, the building department has improved its online navigation. So working with the communication and the IT web designers to improve the navigation and access of the information online, including updating the 170 plus checklist that we have to make it easier for applicants to find um, the list of information, plans, and documents they need to submit as part of their submittal. Public outreach, we continue to post monthly training and assistance sessions for the public. It's every third Thursday of the month, so the next one will be tomorrow from 2, from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. And we've also supplemented it by adding other departments in the session. So tomorrow we'll have public works, and they'll be also providing information on their permitting process and answering questions that the public may have. Um, in 2024, we've started assigning a dedicated permit representative to each permit application. That will be the customer's go-to person throughout the life of their application. So up until now, you apply, then you wait and see what happens. And if you get stuck, you haven't really known who to call. So now, um, as soon as you apply within about a day, one of our permit representatives will reach out, introduce themselves, share their contact info so that um, the applicants can call with any questions and concerns. We believe this will assist with reducing the calls to the call centers and other random areas that, that can't really help them. Uh, we've also taken a proactive approach on dedicating a staff member to contact applicants on stagnant applications that have been sitting with no movement for several months. So we started with quality of life type permits like air conditioning and roofing. Um, and so they'll engage with those applicants to try to resolve any sticking points and see how we can get them to that finish line. And some technological advancements, you may have heard of Decision Engine. This will help applicants pinpoint exactly what permit and submission documents they need for their projects. This is something that IT is uh, working on, the procurement and the legal part of it, and you'll, you'll hear more about it down the line. Virtual inspections, we plan to further explore uh, video technology to conduct inspections, which can save time and resources. And lastly, implementing real-time inspection route tracking and ETA estimated time of arrival notification sent to customers with uh, scheduled inspections. Um, and that's it. We're committed to all of you and the community on ongoing improvements to make the permitting process as efficient and painless as possible. Great. Thank, Thank you, Natasha. Questions. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of changes in the building department. What I'd like to recommend is to have this item be an LTC moving forward, and that way we have it hard copy, looking at it, and can respond to the department as uh, needed. Uh, is my, are my colleagues okay with that? Yep. Okay, let's close this out. Number seven is also uh, the building department. Yes, so this is this was first heard in February of 2023. The commissioners um, had a concern regarding complaints received from residents and small businesses having trouble getting permits and BTR from the county. And so the request was to work with the county um, to get a dedicated person to, to assist with that. So we the county did commit, um, this was May 2023, to providing like a concierge type service to Miami Beach residents and businesses that need assistance. Um, and so the county put that together. They reported that they didn't have any requests um, up until now. We have expanded, or the county has expanded their commitment and now has an in-person uh, representative from the county that uh, sits in the building department once a month, also third Thursdays of the month. So tomorrow they will be here and they're here from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. So any resident or business owner that has a question on county permitting, how to get the permit, how to get a BTR, or if they're stuck, can come over to the building department. Um, again, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. third Thursdays of the month. 
And has um, the building department worked with communications to make sure that the public is aware of this? Yes, yeah, so we have a constant contact list of about 30,000 um, and we send emails out to everybody on that list about this service. Okay, great. Uh, is there any public comment on this? There are no public Colleagues? Comments. Thank you, we can close yeah. this out. All right, number 20. Okay, number 20 is a police item and it is an update on the Barclay Plaza police watch and safety enhancements and we have police presenting the item. They are transitioning into the rooms. Okay. Um, and thank you all for working with us in this space. No, it's an idea yeah. chamber. Hi. Hi. Um, Hi. How are you, Tina? I'm good. Good. Uh, what do you do is we swap in. I'm actually just filling in for them, but that was going to be presenting to you. He's just walking over. I forgot to take the opportunity to say hello. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. <laughs> Here. There he is. Good morning. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Major Daniel Wardala from the police department. How are you doing? I'm excellent. Thank you. So we are calling number 20, correct? Correct. The bar fee. Okay. So um, happy to provide you whatever information you need. I know that in 2023, we had over 800 calls for service at that location. Watch and safety. What enhancements have been made? Um, so from the police department perspective, we have a standing watch order at that location. Three to, three to, three to four times a day, we have officers out there checking. Um, at one point, we had them checking hourly. And unfortunately, that wasn't sustainable based on resources. Um, so as I said before, in excess of 800 calls that we had there, the majority of which are self-initiated calls when officers go to check that property. They advise the dispatcher, it initiates a call. Um, we are continuing to maintain our watch orders there. I know a fence has been erected around the building um, and we are doing everything we can. As soon as a breach is detected, we notify the proper folks at building to come in and, and re repair any type of breach in the surrounding area of the building. Um, and that's where we stand right now. Anything major that's happened in the last uh, month? No, so far we, we and haven't. I've not had heard any. from residents either. So yeah, I think no. um, right now it is working. Job. Yeah, thank you. Any comments on the bar? Yeah, yeah, quick questions. Um, are we using this interchangeably with an entire area, or we're quite literally talking about one property? We're talking about the Barclays property. Yeah, this just, particular one. That's insane. And, and nothing gets hit. And, and really, it, it, hundred calls to one single property. It's ha it's come as a result of obviously the the complaints that we have all received from from the neighbors, um, whether it was homeless people that were establishing squatting in the building and using it as a yeah. as a all you right. know a springboard to conduct criminal activity in the area. Um, several occasions last year, we actually had to clear the building using our SWAT team because it's so dangerous inside the building with the decay of the building itself that it's difficult for us to send regular officers. So we have to send officers to basically clear the building of anyone and then secure it and then conduct the watch order. So it's kind of what brought us to the point where we're at right now. I'm, I'm sorry that we've collectively failed in activating this property that puts the onus on your resources that could be deployed elsewhere. Uh, Chief, uh, are there any other properties throughout this? Uh, th this is baffling to me. Um, any other properties throughout the city that dedicate this amount of resources that should be put on under our radar? Sir, off the top of my head, no, but I imagine some of those calls for service as well was self-initiated because at one point we were checking the property hourly on each ship. So you multiply that by 30 days, for example, you get to get that, that whatever that number is. And so some of those calls may be attributed to that, but off the top of my head, I can't say there's another single property that has many calls for service. Yeah, I, I think while you've seen a theme from our commission of demanding more from our police department, we also have a role to play in legislative policies in not creating an environment that is conducive to these quality of life issues that are a drain on your resources. 
and, and that's sort of the initiative that I looked at one for. So it's truly a tr two way street where when we expect the best from you, we need to position our police department to not be responding to vacant abandoned properties that are in the heart of our city that have been dormant for or vacant for 10 or 15 years that, that are creating this issue. So thank you for being on top of this. And uh, hopefully we look to push forward some legislative policies that help to put into this. Any public comment? We do not have any public comment. Thank you for the update. We'll close this one out. Number 21 is also a police item. Number 21 is discuss take action regarding the police department staffing plan and approach towards enforcement of speeding violations from drivers who operate their vehicles in a reckless or careless manner and any recommendation to enhance enforcement for these defenses. Good morning once again. Uh, Major Daniel Moriello on behalf of the police department. Um, traffic enforcement is a very high priority for our organization as it is for the, the members of this committee, commissioners, and the residents in our city. And we take traffic enforcement and traffic safety extremely seriously. So in 2023, we wrote in Texas as an agency of 61,000, almost 62,000 citations, of which 2,000 of those were for careless driving. Another 52 were for reckless driving. So it is a high priority. Obviously, we have a limited amount of resources. We've expanded our motor unit in the last few months from 12 officers to 15 officers to provide us additional motor officers. Our accident investigation unit is extremely active at conducting enforcement activity during their out, outside hours or off hours through grant funding through multiple different sources. Um, it is our accident investigation unit that initiates most of our uh, noise enforcement and abatement team enforcement actions. And we have requested a budget enhancement as an organization uh, in the next fiscal cycle to see if we can further expand our traffic enforcement capabilities as an organization. Um, we would love to have dedicated traffic enforcement officers whose sole duty is to go out and enforce the traffic laws and hit the different hotspots throughout the city in coordination with our real-time information center so that we can send the problem solvers to the problem locations as quickly as possible. Thank you. And I've heard recently uh, from residents in North Beach that some of the traffic violators are scooters and motorcycles and things of that nature. And I know that um, uh, Assistant uh, Dillis Freya yes, is uh, on the case with that one. So I appreciate that. Uh, is there any public comment? We do not have any colleagues. Major, uh, are there any technological enhancements that the department is collectively looking at? Because we do have a finite amount of resources and, you know, we are asking to do uh, more with maybe the same or, you know, uh, slightly enhanced. But are there ways where we can essentially look to technology to leverage? So recently we, we started to look at, at the request of the co full commission, um, a related item, which is the, the pursuit intervention uh, item where uh, the vehicle could be equipped with uh, a beanbag essentially that is used to tag a fleeing vehicle. So we're looking at that. With regard to traffic enforcement specifically, uh, our, our department technologically is very well equipped that we can always use additional technology uh, in the form of uh, lasers to, to you know, uh, enforce speed. Um, we don't use lasers then. We do, but we can always use more equipment. And more equipment affords us the opportunity to train more officers and to deploy more lasers. How many lasers do we need? I honestly don't know. If that's Sorry, right. I don't. I'll give you that answer. Is it less than ten? Or? Don't have an accurate answer. To you, so I can find out. Okay. Hey, yes, and through the chair. Um, two quick uh, questions, Major. In terms of uh, technology, it's not labor intensive, right? So. Uh, almost the equivalent of red light cameras through speed detection or noise detection. Um, you know, I, I hope we're keeping our eyes and ears open there. And then can you clarify, do the LPR readers, and I know that this isn't exactly on traffic enforcement, but I think it's loosely related. Do those actually sit under your purview in your department? Yes, sir. Okay, they are. And, and how many LPRs do we have? We have an LPR station at every entry and exit point to the yes. city as well as um, 6th Street and Washington Avenue. So I believe we have, we're up to seven or eight. We actually have um, 
um, 22 picks up the art applications of the city. And then uh, we also have portable ones. And, and those portable ones, do they fall within the police department? Because, yes. okay, I, I've heard that we have mobile LPRs that are currently down. Uh, what's the other yeah, we okay. have. We also have LPRs within cars as well. Yeah. Do some of those sit within the traffic and parking department, or are all LPRs uh, with police? Uh, all with police. Okay. I appreciate it. Any public comment? We do not have any public comment. Um. So this item, do you want to move it to commission? I, I have a. Um, I have a. An item on this commission on the January twenty February twenty first uh, to discuss, and I'd like to discuss when all the colleagues are there. Okay, so we can close this yep. one out, and then your item will then take over at the commission. Correct. All okay, right. It's going to read the police department updated the committee item. Correct. Included. So number twenty three is also a police item. And it is discuss the feasibility of the city establishing a crime, crime laboratory to test suspected controlled substances impounded by the police department. Major. Good morning. So I, I believe there was a resolution that was discussed at commission that was to enter into an MOU with the Miami Dade County Lab for our city to fund two positions for lab technicians to work specifically on Miami Beach related. Uh, cases. Um, I believe that where we are as an organization right now is negotiating the MOU of how that's going to work in part as far as payments um, for those positions and what clearly delineating what the city and the taxpayers are getting for this investment to the county. So um... There is, yeah, there is an item that did go to commission last commission meeting, and it did get approved by the entire commission, and the wheel is already in motion. Yeah, so this can be closed item. out yeah. because we have the other item. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. All right. So number 12. Yeah, I'm sorry. Good number 12. Planning. Okay. You want me to go ahead and start? I'll read the okay. Amending the RM3 zoning district regulations in the Miami Beach Residency Code to adopt a 12 a.m. outdoor termination time for the sale and consumption of alcohol beverages and alcoholic beverages establishments along the east side of Collins Avenue from 63rd Street to 72nd Street. Madam Chair? Yes. So this item was referred to committee at the request of our colleague, Mr. Bod. Uh, I think she probably wanted to uh, learn more about this about this item. Um, perhaps I'd suggest deferring this item to uh, to such time that Commissioner Bod can be in attendance. Did the commissioner ask to defer this item? Not this one. She had um, requested to defer the micro mobility, and she had I had copied in the email. She had not requested to close out. Okay. Yeah, with this one, and I did some uh, research into it, it's perspective. Right. Um, so it's not going to affect the Sherry Frontenac. Um, or who were the ones back? There, there were two. Sherry Frontenac has a 5 a.m. I don't know if they serve alcohol outside right. at 5 a.m. Uh, or until 5 a.m. And then there's the Cabana building at 6261 right. Collins that also had a 5 a.m. Uh, I don't know if they renewed their BTR, but assuming they didn't abandon it, they would also have to currently. Right. So I would be concerned if I was affecting existing businesses, but because it's prospective, that's why I, I was okay with it. Is there any public comment? Right now, we do not have any public comment online. And colleagues? And, and, and Madam Chair, just for the benefit of the public, I mean, this applies uh, to the east side of Collins that is more residential in character. And this would be then consistent with the policies we've been advancing through your leadership south of Bid of rolling back alcohol sales there that we're advancing in West Avenue and Belle Isle uh, that we've advanced for the 41st Street Corridor. This aligns uh, with that. Vice Chair Suarez. Uh, just curious, why 12 and not 2? I mean, isn't isn't that the standard that we roll back hours to? Well, this is outdoor. This is outdoor oh. termination time. And so and so with outdoor, we've usually been a little bit more more restrictive. Yeah. Because it's residential. I move the item. 
Okay. Thank you. All so you favor. This for Ruth, a favorable recommendation. Yes. And Madam Chair, just as a point of clarification, this was a dual referral, so we'll go directly to the planning board. Excellent. And one clarification I wanted to make is as drafted, uh, because it was outdoor only, it would apply to an existing business that has a 5 a.m. license. But if you want it to be prospective only, we could um, remove anybody that had a previous BTR as of this date. Um, I'll, I'll leave it up to you, but as drafted, it, it, would, would, it would apply outdoors only to those two existing businesses. Thank you. Appreciate okay. that. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, so we're going to skip number 24 because I gave them a time certain of okay. one o'clock. So let's move to number 14. Okay, so number 14. Sorry. Yeah, oh, oh, sorry. And yeah. with number 14, Please. I would like to co-sponsor this item. You would like to. Okay, I'll make a note that you will be co-sponsoring and number 14 will be environment and sustainability and public works will be presenting. The item is discuss, take action, Referral to the Public Safety and Neighborhoods of Quality and Life Committee to discuss the protection of Biscayne Bay and enhancements of public health and city's resiliency by prioritizing and expediting the implementation of water and sewer infrastructure projects in the city. What number was the slide over there? 14. 14. 14. Did you know she might be able to show us the next one? You want to read Hi, well, good afternoon, um, Madam Chair and Commissioners, Amy Knowles, Chief Resilience Officer. Um, I'm happy to provide a brief background on Biscayne Bay and the policies we've advanced, and then I will turn it over to Joe to talk a little bit on our water and sewer infrastructure. Um, as you all know, Biscayne Bay is a very sensitive aquatic preserve right in our backyard, and it requires a regional approach to tackle some of the serious water quality issues that we are seeing. Um, the health is a major concern and a priority for our city, as well as the county, the region, and the state, quite frankly. High nutrients are one of the major issues impacting the Bay, and addressing it regionally is important because of we have aging sewer infrastructure. We have aging septic tanks on the mainland, but not on Miami Beach. Um, we have fertilizers, and we have decaying organic matter. So we have implemented a lot of protections, and we continue to work with the county um, and municipal partners. So in 2019, you may all remember there was a very significant fish kill for the day. Um, the Miami-Dade County uh, Attorney General uh, created a grand jury who um, issued a report. Subsequent to that, Miami-Dade County, the Board of Commissioners created the Biscayne Bay Task Force, and they issued a report. We invited um, that staff to come and present to the City Commission at that time, and they did so. And they also created an advisory board, the Watershed Management Advisory Board, that exists to this day. And our own commissioner, um, Alex Fernandez, is actually a member of that board, and we participate in those meetings. Um, they recently issued a report that the Bay has $94 billion annual economic value to Miami-Dade County. Um, so our progress in some of this work over the last few years, um, we adopted a fertilizer ordinance. We were the first city to do so in January of 2021 to reduce the nutrient loading. Um, the county subsequently um, also adopted their own a few months later. We also created a water quality ordinance. So we have an inspection program that regulates construction sites to help reduce their impact to the bay. And we also passed a seawall ordinance. And that's important because low seawalls allow water from the bay to overtop to bring in all those pollutants and put it right back into the bay. Um, we also have a national pollutant discharge elimination system program where we do an annual report. It, it looks at the different results. It looks at our different activities. Um, and we do very well with that program. For example, we clean our stormwater system about once a year, and only once every five years is required. Um, we also are a leader in habitat restoration. Um, so we are designing our new parks and green spaces in a way that incorporates ecosystem benefits. I'm sure you're all familiar with Brittany Bay, and we Skiv, and Bayshore Park. Um, we've also engaged a consultant who provided a report on how we can integrate living shorelines in our own city segments. Uh, we have to acknowledge that 91% of seawalls are privately owned, uh, but we're doing everything we can. And we're also doing projects like um, the Reef Line, our U-Link project, uh, working with the University of Miami with the hybrid um, uh, reef off of the coast of North Beach. Uh, we've had a lot of education and outreach. We did a Biscayne Bay, Lee Heart Biscayne Bay campaign that was launched in uh, 2022. 
Uh, we hold certain events like Yak Hour. We uh, talk about don't fertilize the bay, don't be rough on the bay, and also don't be trashy. So we utilize these campaigns for our visitors and residents. And then we also have our plastic-free program as well, uh, which is important for our businesses. So um, with that, just a little overview of some of our policy items, and I'll hand it over to, to Joe. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, Joe Gomez, Public Works Director for the record. So in terms of our water and sewer program, we've, uh, we've done uh, quite a, a few projects um, uh, over the past couple of years. Um, our critical needs now has grown to about $300 million in terms of projects. Uh, we have uh, about 85% of those projects underway in either planning, the design phase, or construction. Uh, upgrades to multiple pump stations throughout the city. Um, one of our big projects was the Dave Boulevard uh, 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 horizontal directional drill that replaced the existing force beam that had multiple breaks. Uh, we've also completed the first phase of the Venetian Causeway, uh, both for the water main and the sewer main and a, and a sewer force main replacement. Um, the second phase, which is the large phase that takes us all the way to the city of Miami limits where we connect, that will, be, uh, have, will start uh, construction later on this year. Uh, and that's critically important because of the county's ongoing project with the Venetian Causeway Bridges. In addition to that, uh, we've got trenchless, uh, what we call trenchless rehabilitation of our sanitary sewer systems where we do um, uh, lining, pipe lining. We've done a significant amount in the Park View area, completed about 90% of the pipes in Park View and about 30% of the manholes. Now we're moving over to the east side of the Park View area, called the Park View Extended Area. Continue that, uh, that yeah. That pipelining pro uh, program, which uh, in essence will give, will not only extend the useful life of the pipes, but it will also prevent uh, leaks from occurring in our gravity sewage system. Um, we've addi additionally, in, uh, we've increased our sanitation um, uh, uh, deployment in the, particularly in part of the area where we had issues. So three times a week, where we do street sweeping as well as hand collection. Uh, we've installed rain domes on, on a lot of the trash. Uh, uh, litters uh, so that um, the the water the, the the garbage doesn't leak out of the, the containers um, and and other multiple projects we've got other projects that are currently in, in design including the the North Beach Town Center project which is currently in the design phase as well. I have a question. Yes, Thank you for the update, both of you. And um, I use an app uh, to see water quality around the city. Um, the Miami Water Keeper is the one um, that collects the water. I don't think that there's one for behind West Avenue. Yeah, can that be added so that we see the water quality there as well? Yeah. I, um, it's Sunset course. Harbor, Collins Park. The app I use is Swim Guide. Yeah, so that is actually um, run by the many water keepers. We can reach out to them um, and share that with them. To add, that is a separate, uh, yeah. um, you know, it's a nonprofit advocacy group and it relies on volunteer sampling. Okay, um, happy to colleagues, any yeah. comments? Yeah. Um, Vice Chair? Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> Particularly around West Ave, do, are the, are the new infrastructure? Do they have injection wells? The uh, the upcoming project for West Avenue, yes, sir. I, it, it not only has a brand new pump station that's currently on, on the construction right now, yeah. but the project will also have a water quality wells as well. Okay, and so if you can explain just to educate us, what are the, what's the purpose of an injection? Injection well essentially is a a, a form of of treatment. Uh, for water quality, so as the first flush comes into uh, a, a pump Your station, storm water. Uh, a storm water. We're talking strictly storm water, not sanitary sewer. So storm water comes into the station. Uh, if there is not a water quality uh, treatment mechanism, there's no outfall, then that that goes into the injection wells and that it's treated. Perfectly. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and and also, and, uh, no, uh, so, and some of the voters are here, and you know, they made posts showing that it. That there's, they claim that there's sewer water going into the bay. Um, it hasn't rained. Is that sewer water going into the bay, or is that tidal we, water? We do not, uh, we do not discharge any sewer uh, unless there's a break, for example. I mean, if there's a break, that's uh, uh, unavoidable, but that uh, it happens. But uh, sanitary sewer flows are never dumped into uh, any any waters of the city of Miami Beach or any well that I know of in Miami Dade County. If I could, Madam Chair, uh, uh, Joe, uh, with what you said for the West Avenue, so yes, uh, going forward at uh, the pace that we're currently going and even expediting that, 
not only is it critical to our resiliency efforts that we continue these projects, but also to the environmental quality of the bank. Absolutely. Absolutely. Stephanie, any public comment? There is a public comment in the nation. Um, I wanted to about that. Mm -hmm. If you guys are name and oh, Carlos. Yeah. Uh, Carlos Leon, I live in 920 Jefferson. Now. Um, about the West Avenue pumps, I pass there every day. It's on every day. The smell is disgusting and throwing the wet. Why don't you, um, with the people that you guys work with, the water, why don't you guys grab the water coming out of that pump and check if it is having wastewater? Because we pass there every day. We can't breathe during those those times. Passing that canal, passing the by the 10th street, they have one, they have one on the 14th one, and every day they're on, and it hasn't been raining for how long? Yeah. So I so, think that water's coming from somewhere, and we should check what's coming out from that water and for the men. Thank you for the feedback. Thank you. I can address the issue of the pumps being on. Um, as you know, we live, we live in a, in a barrier island, groundwater levels, are come up so as the groundwater infiltrates into our system, the pump automatically will because that that's that water will, will seep into our drainage system. So the pumps will kick on and and the work. And the odor of it is and a lot of it is the de so decomposing, so decaying mangrove that that's that, yeah, yes. And that yes. Especially that part of the city is the lower the the, the man-made part of the city that we're mangroves and we're built over mangroves here. So yeah. thank you for the update. I appreciate it. So the action that would be taken if uh, my colleagues are okay with it is for um, the environment department to check and see if the Miami water keepers can add West Avenue so that we can check yes. uh, the water quality there. It's, okay. Was, was the mayor seeking, I'm sorry, was the mayor seeking any uh, other action from, from this item? Uh, sure. With the committee maybe keep it open in case he wants to comment on the side it seems like it was an important item for him. He didn't ask for a time certain and he didn't okay. show up so for his team. The item was an update. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh so let's close this out. And then item number six, which is also your department. Okay, item number six is discuss options for incorporating solar energy installation as part of city's capital projects. Well, um, thank you again, and good afternoon, all. Um, I can provide a brief update of how the city is approaching solar energy um, and options uh, that are being provided by facilities in CIT. Um, Madam Chair, I know this is your item. I'm not sure if you wanted to say anything before I begin. Uh, no, no, please. Okay, great. So our, our recommendation is to fund about $800,000 within the fiscal year 25 budget to start our first um, pilot program for, for solar. Uh, but just to walk you through some of the things that we have been doing, um, I mean, as you know, City of Miami Beach uh, is uh, has been compiling an annual greenhouse gas emissions inventory since 2014, and the data shows that emissions from buildings in the built environment is um, by and far the, the largest source of energy consumption to greenhouse gas emissions in our city, which is very different than other cities that most of our emissions come from transportation. Um, in 2021, our city commission did unanimously adopt a resolution pledging to achieve net zero emissions um, by 2050 for our city. Um, as we know, this contributes to a warming climate, um, extreme heat, and also causes the ocean to expand and ice over land to melt, both of which cause a rise in sea levels and our average elevation is only 4.5 feet NABD. Um, and we do face risk from many sources of flooding. So these, this is a way for us to reduce our emissions, to enhance our resilience, and also provide a decentralized energy source during power outages or emergencies. Um, to grow their use of solar, we did something really unique in 2019. We achieved a SolSmart designation. Um, we tried to reduce the barriers to solar. So really addressing the soft costs. For example, we have waived the fees for permitting. We um, expedite the permitting for solar applications. Um, we also waive fees for the land uh, development public hearings related to solar. Um, we have conducted a lot of best practice research in this area. You know, solar is not simple. It is new to an older city like ours. We met with Orlando staff. We've met with Miami-Dade County. And cities are moving forward in piloted ways to, to try solar. Um, in terms of existing facilities and existing buildings, um, Liz Miro and her team did take a look, and they came up with a few different options. Um, our fleet management building, the 17th Street parking garage, the 1755 Meridian, and the, and the convention center. Um, again, they have requested about 800000 within the budget process to start to pilot solar at the fleet management facility. 
Um, if approved, staff would work with procurement and work with the grants team to obtain those federal rebates as well. In terms of new capital projects, um, there's a lot of facilities that we could uh, integrate solar. So the Marine Patrol facility, we've got Flamingo Park Reef Center, the North Beach Ocean Rescue, Fire Station 3, the Bass Museum, Byron Carlisle, and the Fillmore and Art Deco uh, Museum expansion. Um, as part of design for the Flamingo Park uh, Baseball Stadium, um, CFP has tasked the design consultant uh, for solar to power some of the buildings. And the design phase for 72nd uh, Street Community Complex is underway, and that scope of work does include solar. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities here, and I'm just sharing this with you. I'm happy to answer any questions. So this item uh, came as a result of the Sustainability Committee um, having us look at ways to reduce barriers for solar. So what my recommendation would be is uh, for the 800000 a dollar recommendation for it to review, be reviewed during the budget process for 2025, if my colleagues are in favor. Yes, those for the next budget process. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Stephanie, are there any um, callers, any public right comments? Now, we do not have any callers. And I don't think Thank you so much, Amy. I appreciate the update. And we'll move on to number 15. Okay, so for item number 15 would be presented by Public Works. It's discuss upcoming Miami-Dade County Venetian Causeway Bridge projects. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, so I did receive an update from Miami-Dade County yesterday on the status of the Venetian Causeway project. The project is um, just, uh, they just submitted the 60% plans for, for the Venetian Causeway for the replacement of all the bridges. Um, that um, they expect to have that complete the, the, the permitting and design phase by December of 2025. They expect to go to uh, construction awards in January of 2026. That process will take eight to 12 months because of some of the long lead times of some of the, uh, the for, particularly for the mechanical bridge, the East Basket Bridge. And then the construction is slated to take approximately five years because it has to be done in, in segments and in phases. That's my update on the Venetian Club. Which and there. that, uh, it, you said that it's scheduled to begin in 2026? In 2026, and that's critically important. Uh, and that's why we're trying to get our water main and force main. That's why we have the project that we're starting this fall, uh, uh, so that we can get out of their way, so that uh, our subaqueous and out of their way so that they can come and replace those bridges. And I appreciate the update. I know that they've been in contact with the buildings because I live in one of the buildings yes, affected. And uh, I appreciate our engineer being on those calls as well. As um, And also the Venetian Island Homeowners Association has also been involved and aware so that uh, they can uh, be prepared for planning purposes. Yes, uh, Commissioner Fernandez. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, Great to see that that this is uh, moving forward. When is it that the um, that the signature bridge expected? Oh goodness, uh, Commissioner, the, the last update that I received from FDOT, I think right now it's not slated to be completed until uh, early twenty twenty eight. Early twenty twenty eight. Yes. Okay. So so I that's just the whole project. That's a whole project. Yes, but clearly, um, with that project, that project causes an impact in our city because now people that that would typically be taking uh 395 uh to head westbound towards downtown and other parts of, of miami now they're going either through the venice venetian causeway or through the through, through the, the tunnel. tunnel we see a lot of displacement in traffic uh as as a result of that uh so while the signature bridge is still going on the county is going to start with um, with the Venetian, Venetian in, in, in 26. In 26. Yes. They're going to be overlapping with each yes. other. That means that there's going to be then even more traffic uh, heading uh, on Alter Road towards uh, the Julia Tuttle. Um, this part of Alter Road is already failing. When you look at the map from FDOT, that part of Alter Road is, is already failing. Simultaneously, we have in the works the FDLT Outer Road project. Michigan to 43rd. And north of Michigan Avenue that I think is currently the current timetable sometime like in 2025. Yes, that's sir. supposed to begin. And Great that's time. going to be a long project as well. Yes, I think we need to be looking at the overlap of these projects 
and the queuing of these projects so that they don't over overlap. I think we should probably seriously be looking at this Alton Road project and be urging the state to queue it to occur after the signature bridge is over at least, or wait until you know Venetian Causeway and the signature bridge projects are done because traffic impacts are gonna be horrible. And we haven't even even begins speaking about the Collins Avenue project as well. There's a, I mean, we, you know, it's great that we're doing these projects. But we have to do these projects. We want to do these projects, but we can't bring the city to a standstill. So I think uh, this, we should recommend uh, as part of this conversation that the city commission consider urging FDLT to consider the queuing, the timing of the Alton Road project to occur after the completion of the Signature Bridge and the Venetian College. I agree. Project. Thank you, Commissioner Fernandez. We actually had that conversation with FDOT, you and I, with the two secretaries there, and I urge the city, please have that conversation with FDOT, because if not, our city is going to be complete gridlock with all of these projects simultaneously. FDOT is only worried about their portion of it, the they're not uh, looking at all of the other impacts that are happening. Um, colleagues? Madam, yeah, Madam, would you like to work on a resolution that we could bring perhaps to the commission on that to formally, as a body, as a city commission, urge the urge FDLT to, to consider the timing? Absolutely. And um, do my, oh, is there any public comment? It looks we like uh, Melissa. Yeah, we have one public comment. Yeah. Hi, Melissia. Melissa. If you could unmute yourself for two minutes. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Melissa Beattie from Venetian Islands Homeowners Association. Uh, thank you for, for the update. Uh, we've been speaking with the county uh, extensively and making sure that uh, that the impact on the uh, neighborhood here isn't uh, too drastic. We've already, um, uh, Alex pointed out some of the considerations we need to do with some of the other projects across the city. And I would just like to add a few more things that we are concerned about. Uh, on the planning board, we recently approved a few um, new projects. Two different restaurants are opening up in West Avenue with a 200 plus seats, which we're going to be attracting more traffic. We have the Whole Foods that's going up around the Alton Road area. We have the new office building off West Avenue where the old Epicure is. So that whole area is going to be a bit of a gridlock, which is uh, going to be worse than what we're dealing with um, already. Um, at this point, we have officers that are assigned most days on peak hour to help with the traffic flow. And this is before these new uh, businesses open up. So if we're adding on that, the um, uh, construction of the Venetian, uh, we're, we're looking into a really big mess. And um, I'm not getting much cooperation from the county at this point in evaluating some of the um, possibilities of what we can do to alleviate the traffic across the uh, causeway. I do understand it's 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 a causeway and it's used for the overall general public, but it is a causeway going right across a residential neighborhood. So what I'm asking for is the city to help us in looking at some options and reducing the traffic during the period where we will be undergoing uh, the um, replacement of the bridges. There will be um, bypass along uh, the um, um, raising bridge, but for the other small static bridges, uh, the understanding is that uh, for most of the project, there will be uh, periods where there will only be one lane open, so there will be lights alternating the traffic flow. So you can only imagine with everything coming up how uh, what we're going to be dealing with trying to come home from work or with our children picking them up from school. And this is not a three-month project. We're talking about five years. So um, what I'm asking again is for the city to work with us, with the county, to see if we can impose some sort of restriction on the uh, on the causeway use to be uh, prioritized for the uh, residents by either looking into increased toll or um, whatever the city can suggest and work with us to 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 look at the options of what we can do to uh, make this bearable for the residents for five years. Thank you, Melissa. So I will recommend that the city come back to this committee in April with your recommendation, what you've, able, what you've been able to figure out, whether it's a higher toll, closing it only to residents, uh, and an update for us then. 
Yeah, and I will just add to that. I don't know if we make it part of the resolution or if my colleagues want to, um, but we just continue to really evaluate mass transit options that do not come with any type of significant infrastructure construction uh, because even when we talk about things like the Bay Link, then you can just add on another 10 years of construction on the causeway post that. So when we look at things it could come without uh, any type of significant infrastructure. It would further snarl traffic getting to the end. Things like electric ferries. Uh, maybe I fall short of the helicopter solution, but you know, uh, from the ferry standpoint, uh, plus rapid trace. Um, Bryce. Same. Okay. So uh, we'll bring this back in April, and then we'll move to number three, which is also public work. Um, Yes, Madam Chair. So uh, this one was to discuss um, maintenance of traffic within all city roads. So just a, a, a little bit of, of context, I think it's important. Um, so currently under our, our city code, and I think the city attorney's office may be here, that are here so they can all address some of the legal issues. But uh, we do have um, we do have ordinances that allow us to um, to, to provide a specific hours where uh, it can't be blocked. For example, um, uh, rush hour traffic, we can't have any unless it's an emergency, it's a declared emergency from 7 to 9 a.m. to 4 to 7 p.m. The tricky part becomes where you have roads that are either under the county's jurisdiction or the state of Florida's jurisdiction. Now, we have a what, what I think is a very good working relationship with FDOT. FDOT has, in many cases, in, in most recently, I can cite the Harding Avenue project where they, their start time was later for 7 a.m. and they moved it uh, back to, to 9 a.m. because of the traffic impacts that were associated with that. Miami-Dade County passed an ordinance, I believe it's in 2022, uh, that essentially said that um, any any county facility that, uh, that requires work, whether by one of its contractors for a county project or a utility contractor, uh, they're not required to seek a permit from the municipality. I will tell you that we continue to require permits from our utility providers and from developers, whether it's a city or county street. Um, and with FDOT, FDOT, if it's an FDOT road, the utility company or the developer will have to seek the permit from FDOT first, and then FDOT tells them that they need a courtesy permit from us. So there is a check and balance in the system. Um, we also have um, uh, uh, fees that we charge uh, uh, for for private uh, developers, uh, depending on the, uh, the the designation of the road. If it's a considered a minor street road, um, it ends up being like thirty three cents uh, linear foot per day. Uh, that's a fee that we charge. Um, if it's a, um, a major road, for example, Forty First Street, Alton, uh, Washington Avenue, those are major. That fee significantly increases to three dollars and fifteen cents per linear foot per day. So, in the, you know, as an example, for three hundred feet, uh, a minor street would be ninety nine dollars per day, whereas a, a major street would be nine hundred and forty five dollars uh, per day. And those are the the fees that we charge for it. But so uh, we continue. Um, I mean, to stress, and we've worked closely with both Miami Dade County and FDOT in terms of of uh, permits required, street closures. Uh, we do have a, and you receive the, L, the, L, the weekly LTC on all our MOT projects within the city. Uh, that we that that is updated uh, in real time information. So when it's released on Monday, you get the the notices of all the active lane closures within the city. Um, and we our inspectors go out and, and take appropriate action, and work with code compliance to make sure that if there is an elite. A contractor that's blocking after that, that that code goes down and charges them, and the fines uh, vary. Uh, they start at, at I think it's at five hundred, and they can go up to uh, ten thousand dollars. Okay, um, I I should have a question. You mentioned that FDOT has the process where it's a courtesy. Yes, uh, does the county have something similar? Because I had a situation that I had written to Jose Gonzalez about where. At rush hour traffic, the county was doing work on Abbott and 69. And she contacted her neighborhood officer and right. never heard back. Um, and it was a it was a huge inconvenience yes. since um, things like this happens all the time throughout the city. What can we do with county work? Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, we had a lot more leverage prior to that ordinance that the county passed. And that not only affects us, but it affects every municipality within Miami-Dade County. 
I, 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 my recommendation would be that this would be could be taken up again with the League of Cities again to bring it back to the county's attention because I think the county in, in doing that uh, has restricted our ability to be able to manage traffic flow, not just for us, for other municipalities as well, where, where uh, projects actually flow, the, the impact flows into the city streets. Okay. Um, any public comment? Online, we do not have any public comments. Colleagues? Okay, thank you for the update, and I'll work with the city attorney's office on um, what we can do for county stuff. Will we keep this open? And no, let's close this out. I, I'll bring something new that is needed. Okay, so the next item is number two. And that is um, Miami Beach Drive. And that's Alex. I mean, yes. that's Commissioner Fernandez. Alex is just fine. <laughs> uh, titles come and go. <laughs> So uh, this is an item that, that this committee and that the city commission has been working on for, for, for a while. Um, I placed this on the on the agenda at the beginning of the request from, from MBNA to address uh -oh. uh, immediate issues of, you know, questions on ownership, okay. infrastructure issues. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but Stephanie just told me that this was a time starting at 1.45. Oh. Is it okay to do it now or do we need to wait? Uh, it'll be Great if we could do another because I have to be to something family related at okay. two. Understood. Yeah. Um so so in, in, in essence, um over the course of the, of the last year, we put a lot of focus on Miami Beach Drive. I think we probably haven't invested a lot of city money on it since it's probably developed probably about 40 years ago. Uh, just kind of like band-aids. But in the meantime, last year, we, we went in, we, we look at issues with ballers, with lighting, with flooding, uh, even questions about ownership. And we've been able to settle a lot of these issues. Um, now is the opportunity to see, okay, now, now that we've done the band-aid uh, fix-ups, what is it that we can do for the future of Miami Beach Drive? MBNA, the Miami B, the uh, Mid Beach Neighborhood Association, has had a vision to transform this into a true promenade, uh, providing uh, more, more, more pedestrian friendly facilities and better aesthetics. Um, and discussing this matter with uh, with CIP and with Public Works, they suggested that we that that we make an allocation of funding so that we can hire a company to engage in a feasibility study and put together a master plan for the revisioning of Miami Beach Drive. It truly is a special area in Mid Beach because it runs just um, adjacent to, to, the, uh, to the beach walk. Right. Uh, and it serves a lot of uh, condominiums uh, along Collins Avenue. And I'd appreciate it if the committee could consider uh, recommending to the city commission an allocation of up to $500,000 so that the uh, city administration can have the funds necessary to do a feasibility study and a master plan. So I think we have a caller from MBNA, Alicia Casanova, if we can unmute her. I mean, hi. Hi, um, good afternoon. I'm um, Alicia Casanova representing the Mid Beach Neighborhood Association. And I know Oscar Vasquez, we thought it was at 145, so he's joining at 145. But since I'm here and listening, uh, I'm just going to chime in. We are in full support of, of Commissioner uh, Fernandez's initiative to allocate funds to begin this process. Uh, in the immediate uh, time, we need maintenance on Miami Beach Drive. Uh, we have uh, seen a lot of uh, problems going on with with uh, water and flooding and 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 filth and and so forth. But in the long term, it is a beautiful walkway that deserves to be uh, treated as such. And anything the city can do to beautify it and make it another amenity for our Mid Beach neighborhood and for every Miami Beach resident, actually, it would be uh, very appreciated. So we are in full support of Commissioner Fernandez's initiative. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Fernandez. Uh, I'm also supportive uh, for an allocation that large. It probably should go to the finance department for their review. Uh, what do my colleagues see? Yeah, the only part uh, is, it, is it specifically for design, for for design, or is it for cleanliness? No, this is this isn't even for 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 design yet. And perhaps VIP or or Joe, you can be yeah. I, I, I can I can certainly do that. So 
This is really to have a consultant do a feasibility study to look at Miami Beach Drive cohesively from 24th to 29th to come up with what would be the, the, the future look of Miami Beach Drive, whether it's part of it will be to look at the- yeah, I mean, is, it, is that gonna cost half a million dollars or is it half a million dollars for the project as a whole? No, that's $500,000 is for the study, for the feasibility study. Right, let's, let's run it through the twice. Yeah, actually, I, I think this is much needed in many of our important corridors. I look at some places that are just urban planned with no rhyme or reason. We're sitting atop one right now, 17th Street. I, we have a daycare and a single family home across from City Hall, across from an office building that is right next door to uh, one story. There is no rhyme or reason to a lot of our urban planning on many of our major corridors. I think this is a wonderful opportunity. The one thing that I would certainly urge is let's work with our private sector partners and stakeholders. And especially, I don't know if it's in these specific four or five blocks, but in other areas along Collins Avenue, we have some world-class developers doing world-class projects like the, the Raleigh and things like that. Let's see if they can engage because they have a vested interest in seeing an improved public rights of way. So let's include those private sector partners, especially to the extent where there's any of the condo buyouts that are possibly occurring in this area. Let's work to get them to deploy their capital. Right, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, Sorry, I don't want to make Amy nervous over there. Yeah. <laughs> no uh, sea level rise plug. Um, but, you know, just the gist of that. Uh, let's really engage all stakeholders because one of the things that's incredibly frustrating, I know right on Lincoln Road, um, you have the city doing one thing and then you have developers doing kind of things where we could have all done that in cohesion and done one design properly. So that, let's really reach out, not just limiting the government, uh, but the private sector stakeholders that are working on very substantial projects of that area. And, and, and if I may, through the chair, one of the great things about working with MBNA autists is that unlike many other neighborhood associations, they have also the commercial property owners that sit on in their in their organization. So so they have the condominiums like Trident Towers and Ocean Front uh, and the Riviera and all that that are along that corridor who sit in, in the association, but they also have the hotels as well. And so in engaging in this discussion with, with MBNA, uh, they're a part of, the, of, of, of this discussion. I would love to have a sunshine meeting with you separately about 17th Street, because 17th Street is, is actually something that we should have a meeting about. Oh, because I, I it, it that. is, it, we, we don't need to be talking about the future of that. Uh, I'd say if, it would be great if this committee, Madam Chair, could consider recommending uh, that as part of the budget process, we consider an allocation of up to 500000 not saying that we're going to use all of the 500,000, but giving them the opportunity to consider up to 500,000 as part of the capital budget process. Yeah, that sounds good to me. How do my colleagues feel? Yeah. Okay, so let's move this item. Thank you, colleagues. All right, so it's one o'clock. I think we have a time cer certain uh, for number 24. It will be presented by Environment and Sustainability. It's going to be discussed pedestrian and bicycle safety on beach walk and any options for creating a bike path on the hard park sand to minimize the interactions between bicyclists and pedestrian on the beach walk. Thank you, Lindsay. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Lindsay Prex, the Assistant Director of the Environment Sustainability Department. I'm happy to provide an update on what we know and provide an overview of the details in the memo. These details have also been provided in a previous LTC and past committees. The administration has conducted research to advise on the regulatory requirements to establish a bike path east of the dunes along the hard path. As part of this research, we contacted the Florida Department of Environmental Protection for their requirements. Hard path is defined as a sand road, which is naturally occurring over time west of the erosion control line that's used by public safety and other authorized vehicles. While sand compacts to varying degrees over time and over the length of the beach, the established hard pack that is recognized by the Beach Maintenance Division extends from 6th Street to 19th Street. Beyond these limits, it's reasonably understood that a beach cruiser with extra wide tires would be required to traverse through that sand. There are limitations on what can be permitted seaward of the dunes and on the beach. This area is east of the dunes and it must follow the Coastal Construction Control Line or CCCL permitting requirements 
as part of that program, which was established by Florida State Statute 62B-33, Chapter 161, which is titled Beach and Shore Preservation. One of the main intentions of that program is to safeguard the resilience of these natural systems and encourage the ability of the area to bounce back to these original conditions after a stressor. The CCCL program statute regulates structures and activities that can cause beach erosion, destabilize dunes, damage the uplands, interfere with public access, and the program also protects sea turtles and dunes. Since the city would be asking for what's considered a new activity under the statute, we would need to attain approvals through the CCCL program. A bike path is considered an activity and changes the nature of the existing sand. Through that permitting process, we would need to prove that there would be no impact to sea turtles pursuant to the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Sea turtles nest in soft sand, therefore we would need to prove that the establishment of this bike path would not change their nesting habitat. And the victim card path is utilized by sanitation and emergency services, so it would have to be planned so as not to interfere with this. I just want a point of clarification. I know that MBNA has been advocating for this item, and they've been advocating for pedestrian, not a bike path, and they wanted clarification on that language. I believe MBNA is on. Um... Of course, yeah. If if we were to allow pedestrians or bicyclists to use the beach as it currently stands, that would not be considered a new activity. But if we were to construct a path that would make it easier or be considered an official path, it, whether it's a movie mat or some sort of brick structure, mm. that would be considered a new activity. However, if we as a city would allow pedestrians and bicyclists, that's where that differentiation comes into play. But, uh, Vice Chair, how much of a how much of a buffer is there between the dunes and the intended bike path or the walk path, the hard pack sand? Uh, it's it's very limited. It depends on every single area, but pretty much as soon as the dunes end, there's that natural compaction that happens over time. And how wide? Would it be? Um, it's enough for uh, vehicles to traverse. I, I'm sure beach maintenance could provide the exact width. Uh, Commissioner Fernandez. Okay, so for it not to be designated a new activity, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? What is it then? What would it not be designated as a new activity? So if we as a city decide to allow pedestrian bicyclists to use that area without changing the nature, so if we would just say like, okay, it's allowed now, um, they would be able to use that area. Whereas if we installed anything to officially make it easier for people to use, utilize it as a path, that would be considered an activity. So it's the fiscal installation. Correct. Okay. And there's no way to be able to compact the sand that's already there without installing anything? It so naturally occurs over time. So it's just that natural fluctuation of the system. So it's the designation that we allow bicycles on there that is the the, the the hurdle? No, it's the activities that would make it easier for people to use because right now the only official hard pack is that 13 block so section. What I was going to say is what if we just, we don't say necessarily that it's for bicycles and and we if we, if we, if we don't say that, can we move forward with this? We, and not have to go through a permitting process? If, if we just allow residents or visitors to utilize this area, then we would not need to go through the state. But if we change the nature of this segment, then we would. But, but, but you need something for them to walk up because you have very soft sand. And, th and that's- So the moment, we, the moment we actually compact the sand, regardless of what our intention is or what we telegraph, we have to go through the permit. And how long is that process? It depends on their workload at any given time. Special events permitting, which are typically smaller in nature, can take a two to three month period. Um, the beach walk, which also required CCCL permit, was a much longer time frame. I'm sure David can give that exact time. And, and, and what, what is the area or the streets for this item in particular? Is it all of Miami Beach? This area was just a general um, discussion item to provide any research we were able to uh, obtain from the state. Well, I, I mean, personally, I think it'd be great to have a beach park pack sand for bicyclists to use. I mean, yeah, it's just, it's, it's lovely. And so, um, you know, I would I would want to move forward. Yeah, same this. here, but I believe we have some public comment. Can we get Alicia? So if we could unmute Alicia, so have two minutes. Okay, I'm I'm back and I'm listening to, um, to this interesting conversation. So let me understand this. We... Um, if we compacted the sand, let's say six feet wide, east of the dunes, 
just compacting. There's areas that the sand is very soft and it's hard to uh, to walk by. We are not proposing anything. To, bicyclists, first of all, would probably not enjoy, and they probably won't be um, going to the beach to the uh, beach to ride a bicycle, whether it's soft or hard. They don't like to ride on sand. So we're not um, we're not advocating for bicyclists to use it. We're advocating for an alternative to pedestrians that when the beach walk is crowded and full of bicycles, that they can comfortably go access this particular area and just walk. It's the same sand. It's not going to interfere with sea turtles because it's it'll be made of sand. I don't know. That's up to you if you want to add pea rock uh, like they have in, in Bal Harbor, which they have these walkways from Surfside to Bal Harbor made of sand compacted with P rock and then providing an alternative anybody that wants to walk there right now anybody can walk through that area right it's the beach so we all walk it the difference is that the city will make it easier to walk it by by compacting the sand would that require ccl and this whole bureaucracy just to compact the sand uh or or this is we're not at, we're not even saying the word bicycles I mean, we we know that bicycles, to get bicycles out there would be dangerous, actually, because you have the bridges connecting the beach walk to the beach. And if you have bicycles traversing uh, east of the dunes, that that's kind of dangerous. People are walking, you have to cross a bicycle path. No, that's not. The language was erroneously written in, in this uh, item. So I think that that's very clear what, what Commissioner Dominguez said uh, at the beginning. So that can be corrected to say just a beach pedestrian pathway made of compacted sand. Um, we're, we're hoping or assuming that this could be uh, done without extensive costs or extensive uh, bureaucratic processes from CCL or from anybody else, because it's really just using the same sand except compacted. Um, is that something that that uh, we're on the right path to advocate for? Uh, yeah. I, I think the idea is what is the best, what is the path of least resistance to get this? Well, the state would review any application that we put forth. Just know that they would not be able to approve any application that does not meet every requirement of the state's statute. How did, this, how did it get compacted between 5th and 17th or 19th? It's naturally occurring. So the structure of the beach in that area is a little bit different. There's a lime rock layer and just consistently over time, it can compact a little bit better there. And I think we have another public comment. Tammy Stoller, are you here for that item? Thank you, Madam Chair, for commenting the time today. My name is Henry Stoller. I live at 1500 Ocean Drive, where I have lived for 19 years full time. Everything that I'm going to testify to today is based on my personal experience and personal observation over an extended period of time. Two or three times a week, I leave my home on 15th Street. I bicycle up to the city limit at 87th Street, turn around and come back. All I'm talking about is my personal experience and observation. Occasionally, I will take the shorter routes and come out of 15th Street, turn right and go down to MacArthur and turn around and back. I'm well familiar with it. I encourage you to abandon pursuit of a parallel flight path. The proposal here is well-meaning, well-intentioned, made in good faith, in recognition of the fact that the beach walk's location and beauty have made it the victim of its own success. But the proposal does not address the real problem. Bikes are not the principal problem. The beach walk was built for bicycling, which is completely legal. The real problem is motorized devices, which are completely illegal. So we have turned this on its head and not addressed the problem of people who are out there acting illegally on all manner of dangerous motorized motorized devices, and instead are addressing bicycles for whom this was built. There are huge differences in speed and weight between a motorized device and a bicycle. Please reflect on whether you'd rather be hit by a bicycle or a motorized device. There's quite a substantial difference. Here are six additional reasons 
for abandoning this concept. This concept. The staff report is miraculous as one would do. It is polite, it is circumspect, it is deferential and respectful. But plainly trying to pursue this effort would take the administration into a regulatory morass. The report is too polite to say that, but it's perfectly clear that's the message. We'd be looking at years and costs. We are already on LTC number eight on this modest little project of closing the north two blocks of Ocean Drive in order to create the little promenade there. This is going down the rabbit hole based upon my reading of the law as set forth in the staff memorandum. It's a great piece of legal writing. The staff report also reminds us that the beach walk took 19 years and in yesteryear dollars cost $45 million. There would be more engineering challenges and therefore greater costs when building directly on the beach because there would be no protection from the sand and the wind. The beach walk has some natural protection from the dunes and the vegetation on the dunes from blowing wind, blowing sand. This will be out naked in the open with no tree cover to protect people from the sun as the beach walk in many segments provides. And so it's going to be longer, costlier, and probably unable to be fulfilled. Thank you, Henry. May I have one more minute, please? Uh, you give you that four minutes. You're at four minutes. I'll give you 30 seconds. Okay. All right. There'll be more maintenance because there'll be far more blown sand. Uh, more destructive of a feature of the natural environment. We tore out a huge section of the beach walk, pardon me, of the dunes and of the vegetation to build third to fifth street on the beach walk. This repeats that assault on our environment. The cost of enforcement will almost double because now we're going to have to have categories of violations. You are on the wrong walk. You could be on the bike path, you should be on the beach path. Madam Chair, if I may have 15 seconds to say, we should not seek brand new projects to address the beach walk's problems. First, as the mayor suggests, some portions of the beach walk might be widened. Secondly, Jose Con uh, Gonzalez is working diligently and doing a fabulous job on better signage, more stri striping, more directional arrows. And he's gotten $200,000 into this year's budget for that purpose. Third, we need better enforcement, and that's the subject matter of item 22 to be heard next month. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You. I appreciate Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have to leave soon. Um, but I listen, we have hard pack uh, from, from South, South Beach all the way to about 24th Street. Uh, I can tell you that at 24th Street, I, I start to become part of the traffic because then I transition over uh to the beach walk um i think you know there was vision 19 more years ago when someone had the vision to start working on on the beach walk it took years it took decades to to to, to get it done but eventually we got there at some point we need to have to start start a conversation even if it takes us down a bureaucratic process uh horrible regulatory process at some time point we need to start the process of just saying hey listen Let's continue the hard pack, uh, or let's put the pad down, and let's just try to get approval from the state to do that that pad. From what I'm seeing uh, here, you know, the state will have to determine whether it's going to cause adverse impacts to 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 the dunes or erosion or or other stuff. I don't think, you know, putting a uh, continuing the hard pack that already exists further north is going to do any of this. And I think as a as a commission, we should start that process. Uh, I respect uh, Henry very much. Um, I think his comments about border motorized vehicles is accurate. But 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 the real problem on the beach walk is that it's overcrowded. It's overcrowded, and we need capacity. The only way that we're going to get that capacity is if we go out into into the sand. Okay, um, Actually, Vice I, Chair. I fully agree. With, uh, move it to the commission. I, I, I would like to move it to the commission. Yeah, and I, commission. I would just say, uh, 
I don't look at these as mutually exclusive, uh, even if there weren't overcapacity issues. I just look at this as some sort of added amenity uh, because it is such an attractive place and what better way to be able to utilize that. So Mr. Solon, you have my utmost respect and you have my commitment that pursuing this path will not mean that we do not continue to uh, look for enhanced enforcement mechanisms on our beach walk as it exists. I don't look at this as uh, creating some sort of uh, easy way out to skirt enforcement. This is just something that could just be an enhanced amenity. And it is not because we're looking to skirt the responsibility of the beach walk. So uh, thank you for your always, always uh, uh, well thought out input. Thank you. So uh, move to the commission, please. Uh, favorable. With a favorable recommendation. And number nine. Okay, item number nine is a public works item. It discuss pressure washing in order to improve the cleanliness and aesthetic of the city property. Madam Chair, um, uh, in the memo that we provided to you, we detailed um, uh, the, the efforts uh, of our sanitation team in pressure washing. And I think we've outlined the specific areas that we currently uh, target. And those will be the Lincoln Road Mall, both east and the west side, Red Beach, North Beach, Ocean Drive, Washington Avenue, north and south. Let me bring the maps. I have a map. Oh, the public pressure one. That's good. Give me a second. Check. Well, we're waiting for that. I don't know if uh, Matthew has the same race for. I think it's for the previous one. Oh, happy to hear from him. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Wait, yeah. Hear from Matthew. Well, Matthew, wait. we moved on from the project, but we're going to have you uh, share your thoughts. Okay, thank you. And you, you can hear me now, correct? Yes. Correct. Okay. Uh, I want to say, of course, I know Commissioner Fernandez left, um, uh, but you know, I agree with Alicia. Uh, from MBNA and Henry as well, who we've talked about the beach walk for many years. I'll be very brief, of course. Uh, I couldn't agree more with you that there's capacity issues on the beach walk. It is a, a, a victim of its own success. And many people enjoy it for recreation, but also for utility, whether they're commuting, whether they're taking their kids to school uh, or going again, I'm repeating myself here, going to the doctor, going to a store, et cetera. Um, one of the other options, of course, other than going on or in addition to going on to the beach is, again, building out our on-street bicycle network, which really hasn't seen much progress uh, and success of being implemented over the last five to 10 years. So, again, I can just encourage you all to see what can be done to allocate more resources, whether it's staff and or money to uh, accelerate this uh, amenity that many, many, many residents, if you look through all the surveys that the city manager's office does in 2019 and 2016, I think 2022 as well, safety on our streets is a number one priority. So whatever can be done by our elected officials to help spearhead that and uh, make our streets more inviting, that will reduce the number of people on the beach walk. Thank, Thank you, Matthew. You. Okay. Back to the special order? Yeah. I don't know where you left off. Uh, we just skipped it. Sorry. Here. Uh, well, I don't know if you want to do your presentation or you want to. I, I wanted to go through the. Uh, yes. So, um, as as Commissioner Soares, this is uh, a level of service map that we, um, we uh, provided to our team so that we um, uh, detail our levels of service um, depending on the area of the city. And that includes not only pressure washing, street sweeping, but also hand collection as well. So obviously, for example, if you go to a level of service A, that's probably the, the most intense. That's in, sorry, down south. Yeah, down south. So um, yes. So if you go down to, for example, the- Do you need health Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. It's tough with this memory. So the the most intense areas that we do uh, maintenance obviously are the high traffic areas uh, starting in the South Point area um, as well as the Washington <laughs> okay so the Washington Avenue area uh, Collins Avenue uh, the, these areas uh, carry uh, not only pressure washing uh, but as well as uh, street sweeping uh, hand collection as well. And then, for example, in the residential areas, currently we do not provide any kind of pressure walking in any other residential areas of Miami Beach. 
Uh, we do pressure washing as well. We started our initiatives in, in, the, in, in the Palm View area, as well as areas in North Beach as well. We also do, um, it, during high impact weekends, uh, other uh, venues, uh, we increase our pressure washing. We have seven pressure washing units that are deployed throughout the city, depending on the schedule. Uh, the pressure washing schedule starts at 4 in the morning to 12.30 p.m. And the reason for that is we don't want to be doing pressure washing when there's high activity on the sidewalk because, again, it interferes. So we're going to try to get it out of the way before we have a lot of high activity. Um, and so that this kind of gives you a, a, an overview. Uh, and, and I'm sorry it wasn't attached to the, to the memo, but it does provide uh, the different level of service that we provide in terms of sanitation throughout the city. So... Uh, yeah, to jump to that. Yeah. Uh, so you don't you don't do any pressure washing in residential areas. Right? No, sir. Okay. And then also, like we had discussions earlier. Yes. So hand crews three days a week, mechanical. And yes. So, um, where you do pressure washing, it doesn't necessarily. I think where it says um, pressure washing, pressure cleaning five days a week. That doesn't necessarily mean that um, that particular area. That is correct. If I pinpoint on a map, uh, it's, the, dark. it's the entire area that would get five days a week. And that reason is pressure washing is a pretty slow operation. Um, and typically, for example, the Lincoln Road, it takes about, it takes the entire day to do about two blocks to, to them to be able to do. So it's a, it's a slow operation by nature. But there could be a, in a situation where a section of the area, for example, A, within a five-day period doesn't get pressure washed. It could be anywhere in that zone gets gets five days. If it's designated for pressure washing within that five-day period, it will get touched within that five-day period. Every every part of that of the zone. Yes. Okay. Yes. But not every day. Now, to, to your point, it's five days a week so within cover a five-day We cover the, the area in, in five days. In five days. Okay. Um Yes. Sure. Yes, sir. Understand the, the blanket assessment there where you clean, where you do not. Are there areas in your assessment where you're not cleaning where you look around the city, your staff looks around the city and say, you know what, maybe we should really be doing here. I, I know personally, this is anecdotal, just people reaching out to me in the Flamingo Park area. And when I see it walking down the street, the sidewalks there, yes, uh, I'm like, Wow, this this is not how I picture Miami Beach. This, this is not the right level of cleanliness for our residents. I guess let's use that as a, an anecdotal right. example. What would it take to add that to maybe not five times per week, but to what would to do um, pressure washing, for example, in the Flamingo Park area? Yeah, we would have to dedicate uh, a, a team and, and, and a piece of equipment to that so that we could service it uh, yeah. in, in the Flamingo Park area. Because again, um, if there's a lot of residential streets, we have the tree canopy, which presents a series of problems with eaves and all that. So, um, you know, one one possibility is to look at uh, for the residential areas, and I think we had the, this this discussion with Commissioner Forrest, is to maybe look at a uh, at a model where we would do uh, twice a year uh, in residential areas. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, any resolution, I'd like to include that. Um, for you to come back and say these are okay this is the policy now but i think i see the way the commission is i hear the feedback of the residents um here is uh kind of threading that needle and uh add to this of course i have an item actually on the 21st to discuss the pressure yes. yeah it, it was it was actually tied in with the gum stain removal but we never got yeah. that part yeah. of the of the item so um that dovetailed with we're going to hear Excellent. it again. Yeah. All right. So we'll close this out. Thank you for the update. Thank you for the map. And, the, and, and the only suggestion, February 21st, we'll discuss it. And the only today. suggestion that I would give to public <clears throat> works is, you know, I, 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 I would really appreciate some maybe before and after pictures. So I know it takes to do two blocks on Lincoln, take a before picture and then take an after picture because right now it's basically up to uh, the supervisor to see if it's done or not. But you know, there are residents that complain, hey, my street isn't clean. And so if you have a before and after picture, you can say, hey, look, this is this timestamp. We took a picture. It might have gone dirty after, but, you know, we at least did our job. So I don't know if there's a, if we can, 
we, we can certainly do that. I get photographic uh, information from the teams once they complete a, a, an area, but we can certainly do the before and after. So. Great. Okay, number 11. Okay. I think that's my last one. No, you don't have two more. more. Oh, I got two more. Oh. <laughs> okay. <Great job. laughs> All right, so number 11 is the, the, the item on blocking the, the, the dumpsters. So our, our team, our sanitation uh, director and, and, and assistant director went out and looked at, um, and this was brought, I believe, by um, by the uh, folks in, in the ADNA area as well as Ocean Drive. So we looked at, and, and the, there's, there's two things. That, that I, we don't have an issue with blocking dumpsters, however, I don't think we should require all dumpsters to be locked. And the reason for that is a lot of these dumpsters dumpsters go into enclosures. If it's inside an enclosure, there should not be an issue. Those dumpsters that, because the, the buildings are older and they don't have enclosures for dumpsters, then we would see no, we would have no objection to have those having locks. And we can prescribe that as part of our RFQ, RFP process going forward for, for, for sanitation services. Right. So because if we were to do that, then it would be an extra charge because they'd have to get out of the truck and go in a lot of it. Uh, so I don't recommend this at this time. I appreciate the update on that. Is there any public comment? Mark, anybody? Yes. Yeah, Mitch yeah, Novak. Mitch Novak. How do we get him? Um, okay. Hi, folks. Can you hear me? Yes. Good, good afternoon. Uh, I manage a building on 6th and Jefferson, and my neighbor has a lock on her dumpster. And unfortunately, her tenants are lazy and fill up my dumpster as quickly as it is emptied. So I, I think it's a bad idea to require locks on uh, trash uh, bins. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, colleagues, do you have any um, thoughts? There would just be more trash on the floor. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Uh, this, let's see, it was just a discussion item regarding the use of secured dumpsters. The committee does not think secured dumpsters are the way to okay, go. Let's so move this on. And um, I think we're approaching our last item. And I will tell you, uh, my colleagues here, so when I had my briefing about this committee, I was told that it would take six months for us to get up to date because things weren't moving out of this committee previously. Um, so we're approaching the last item. Thank you guys so much for starting really <laughs> And uh, maybe we'll get through uh, the backlog quicker than six months. But I really appreciate it. Joe, take it. Take it away. Okay, so uh, item 13, uh, Madam uh, Chair, is the discussed light improvements at the crosswalk of Pine Tree and Sharon in, in front of the Scott Rake House. So I had our operations team go out to take a look at the, the intersection to see how what we could do, because obviously Pine Tree Drive is, is a county road, but uh, based on the observations of my operations team, we can place one light within the, the that general area, one city with light, <clears> and then a, and work with FPL on attaching Two additional lights um, on their light poles, on their electric poles, which would be a joint use pole, and I think we can uh, substantially improve the lighting in that in, in that intersection. So, um, if if, if uh, we're ready to proceed, if if the so, um, colleagues, ready to proceed with their recommendation yes. of that lighting? Yeah. Okay. okay let's, any public comments? You don't have any public comments. All right. Um, so I think. We are, we heard all the items for today. All right, wonderful. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Thank you. That was quick. And we're 30 minutes out of schedule. I didn't know. I did Oh, turn it off. And this is for this.